Jessica, you can come on up here. You guys will grab that chair. Oh. Remember, <laughs> so, um, so in the public hearings, I on public hearings, that's okay. That's okay. I'm going to use my And then a lot of people, sometimes we do get to that 30 minute period. And I'll do that. Yeah, uh -huh. and I've got that right here. All right, it's six o'clock, Councilman Harris. Um, is Joe online? Because I'm not seeing him. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. I do not see him yet at this time, Mayor. Um, Ginger, has he just, you'll log him on when he logs in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. He's joining now. Okay, that's fine. All right, it is six o'clock, and unless there's an objection, I call this regularly scheduled Dunwoody City Council meeting uh, October 
um, 10th, thank you, at 6 p.m. to order. And Councilman Seconder, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we will start with the invocation and pledge of allegiance. Uh, Councilman Lambert, please. Ms. Raz. At this meeting, help us to make decisions which keep us faithful to our mission and reflect our values. Give us strength to hold to our purpose, wisdom to guide us, and a keen perception to lead us. And above all, keep us charitable as we deliberate. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, first up is public comments. Ruth Meehan. Um, Jay, can you just make sure the green light is on, please, and the microphone is adjusted? Hello. Thank you. Um, I, you make sure you speak in, I'm sorry, Jay, can you adjust a little more? And you'll have three minutes once we get the technical issues worked out. I'm a short person, sorry. I mean, I, <laughs> You speak my language. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Thank I you. just wanted to comment about the uh, project for Peeler Road. Um, uh, our home and a number of others back up to that road. And um, perhaps you all don't know it, but there is um, people drag race on that road. And I understand that there has been put forth something to make, to take out um property behind our houses, including the trees, um, in order to make a larger walkway. However, we have a walkway that's tree lined on the other side, which is very lovely. And the problem with taking out the trees, it's going to really impact on uh, the property values of every one of us who back up to Peeler. And it'll make it um, with the extra, I mean, I don't have a problem with extra lights at corners, you know, at street corners. I do have a problem when they're along the road because right now there is a large light that shines directly into anybody's house at night. And um, I, I just think that this ought to be rethought because we also have to remember too that there are birds that live in those trees and there's plenty of, um, well, even even little fireflies, you know? And I think it would be really very sad to lose that whole bank of trees just to make a bigger sidewalk when there's a perfectly reasonable one on the other side. Thank you. Thank you. John, you, I'm gonna, Yule, is that right? You can correct me when you're at the microphone, please. And you'll have three minutes. Thank you so much. It is you. You go ahead, John. Uh -huh. Yeah, it there is. you go. There oh, you yeah. go. Thank you. Turn it off like a real <laughs> um, Thank you so much for having us here today and, and Liberty about this. Um, I'm also here for the Peeler Road uh, sidewalk extension uh, discussion. Uh, and to echo what Mrs. Meehan over here had to say, obviously, you know, I live over there. My house backs up against the property. Um, I do understand certainly the importance of having sidewalks. Uh, my son is five years old, and he's learning how to ride his bicycle, which is a ton of fun, by the way. Um, so this was his third weekend uh, rocking the bike. Uh, the problem is, is that we also like to be in the backyard. And one of the things that I worry about, uh, you know, is, again, the light and the sound pollution. It's having cars racing up and down there. Uh, and certainly, you know, taking out all those trees, it exposes us a little bit more. Uh, it makes it a little, little more a little more anxiety filled when we're having them in the backyard. If anyone can just poke over the fence or anything of that nature, that's, that's a real, that's a real concern for me as a parent. You know, obviously I, I keep an eye on them, but there's no way I can even put them in the backyard. And I grew up playing in the backyard and running around and I would, I would hate for him to lose that opportunity. I think a lot of us had that experience growing up. And I think that maybe the best thing to do, or maybe something we should explore if it hasn't already, because I don't know, is there is a great sidewalk across the street the challenge is, is getting there. There are no protected pedestrian crossings. That's one, of the, that's one of the things that's really frustrating. So if you go to Four Oaks Drive, there's just traffic going. And people do drag race down there. Uh, in fact, actually, last night I slept in the backyard in the tent. Two of us had a little camp out. And I could hear them just, <clears throat> just bombing up and down. And I can tell you exactly how many sirens I heard last night. None. 
I heard a whole bunch of drag racing and I heard no one coming out there doing anything about it. And that has me a little, again, a little anxious. You know, it's a place where criminality happens. And as we all know, when there's a little bit, it tends to attract a lot. And so maybe we should explore other ways of mitigating some of the some of the issues out there, improving the sidewalk, improving the pedestrian access, things of that nature, but in ways that don't necessarily impact our lives, the fireflies and the butterflies and all that kind of fun stuff that's there in the backyard. So anyways, I don't know how much time I have left, but thanks so much for your time. So I had a little scattered thoughts. It's kind of it's a lot of pressure being up here tonight. So there you go. You're used to that. Have a good thank day. thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Leahy. When you get to the microphone, you start speaking, you'll have three minutes. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. I'll join the future residents of Cherokee County mm -hmm. in their warning about making Dunwoody less habitable than it's been. Um, Atlanta was built with without sidewalks. I don't know what they were thinking. Nobody had any. When we had to put them in, we took away some of the road. We put the bike lanes in, took away some of the road. We're seizing property now, some in the easement, some beyond the easement for which we'll have to pay. But um, I, I doubt that anyone realizes that there is a plat, and that's a diagram of your property with measurements and the plat includes the easement. And if you seize property and take some of that easement, that plat must be changed uh, in, uh, in DeKalb County. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, uh, that, that the, the people who were affected on this round of trail building are aware of that. Uh, in addition, it affects property value. It affects quality of life. And we came in 40 years ago, like to stay here. Uh, but Cherokee County is looking pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hickey, did you want to wait for the public hearing of the budget or you would like to go now? You can do both, actually. You can have two separate times yes sir okay just come up to the microphone if you want your three minutes that's fine oh I see you gave me two cards I missed that you're welcome to speak on whatever you want the first three minutes I did not see that that was your card go ahead you'll have three minutes sir thank you very much madam mayor mm -hmm. Council, I appreciate your comments your your, your time tonight I'm Bob Hickey. I'm a 45 plus year resident of the uh, city of Dunwoody. I'm talking in this section on the proposed 2023 budget, which in my opinion is the most irresponsible physical budget document that's been presented to the, to the citizens and the mayor and the council in the uh, 13 year history of Dunwoody. Highly irresponsible. You go from a well, well capitalized city uh, to a city that we're going to be we're, we're running on perpetual deficits, okay? In 2019, pre-pandemic, the city spent about $41 million a year. Now they're spending $62 million a year, 50, almost a 50% increase in three years. The deficit is going from 781000 to $16.9 million. And you can say, Hickey, you're crazy. It's not what we're going to be as a deficit. It's your document, okay? There is some funny money in there when it talks about the Fed ARP money, but your document shows a deficit of 16.9 million. So, but I think you ought to listen to what the city staff is telling you in this budget document. They, they use words such as the forecast showed we need a 0.669 mil increase in 2024. Okay, listen carefully. This increase would not allow for any expansion of services. That's the city staff's document, okay? They also say the city would need to cut 5.9% of the, of the general fund, okay, to balance the budget in 2024. And that would be no new programs or openings of staff. 
if you need to cut 500, you need to have $500,000 increase in operating expenses, it would require 1.265 mills, okay, to make that happen. Or you can do it the old fashioned way and cut expenses, okay? So you have an option to, opportunity to do things physically responsible. And the physically responsible thing to do is to balance, send this budget back to the staff and tell them, get it balanced, get it balanced. No new tax increases, live within our means. How do you do that? You cut expenses, okay? Every department looks like to me, it has a manager and an assistant manager. One of those could be gone tomorrow, okay? Everybody doesn't need an assistant. Sorry, everybody doesn't need an assistant. Uh, cut, send the ten million dollars in the federal money back home. All that do, all that's doing is three years from now, okay? It's going to increase city operating expenses by three to five million dollars. That's thank you, Mr. Hickey. Your, your budget documents. Cut the budget. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, that concludes public comment, unless someone else had a comment with no cards yet. Um, and we will have an um, opportunity to, does anybody have a card? that um, We'll have an opportunity at the budget for comments on the budget, um, as well as a public comment section at the end. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is our city manager report, Mr. Linton. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, we have a very in-depth report before y'all this evening on the police department uh, on November the 10th from 6 to 9 the Dunwoody Police Department will participate in a panel discussion related to sex trafficking and that will be held at the Dunwoody United Methodist Church also officers conducted a dist uh, distracted driving and crosswalk detail at Shamway Dunwoody Road and Dunwoody Park as a result there were 24 citations were issued also within those type of stops we have we had two arrests were made and uh, 13 of the citations for hands-free violations, and six were for vulnerable road user ordinance. Um, so that's something we really are trying to work on is distracted driving within the city. The um, Metro Atlanta Traffic Enforcement Network recognized Dunwoody Police Department with an aware of achievement for outstanding performance in the Governor's Office of Highway Safety Distracted Driving Campaign for April 2022. We also received a grant for $7,859 for Bulletproof Best Partnership. Um, within the report, there are numerous times throughout it, you'll see license plate reader hits. Some are from stolen autos. We had one for a stolen U-Haul. We had one for a, another vehicle that was stolen and the suspect had a warrant out of New Mexico on them. We also had some uh, shoplifting at Best Buy. That suspect was found to be wanted from another state for murder. So the police are really on top of um, using the latest technology to catch people. Unfortunately, they're, they're in, in Dunwoody, but they are being caught. It's a fortunate piece. Also, um, on 285 Shamwood Dunwoody Road, there was an overturned vehicle. The driver showed signs of an opioid overdose. Also, we did have a suicide threat at Perimeter Mall. Fortunately, the victim was talked off the ledge before officers arrived, and that was also a missing per person that was out of Tennessee. Um, so um, we also had a swatting calls were up a little bit last month where people were trying to lure the police into a certain area, and then um, a little bit a few more entering autos. But the bottom line that I wanted y'all to know about within the police are these license plate readers, and the other methods that we use for just regular crimes and what it sometimes turns up when you have somebody wanted from another area. So uh, the, the department does a very good job with that. Um, we also have the um, public works, Spalding Drive detours now in place at Dunwoody Road and Shamley Dunwoody Road for the storm pipe installation. We also are upgrading um, that pipe as well. The Georgetown Gateway Project is well underway. Winter's Chapel Trail, also the Shamley Dunwoody Womack intersection, and the Dunwoody Road sidewalk are all underway. The, um, the department removed 86 sidewalk trip hazards on Kings Down Circle and North Springs Drive, and also Blount Construction completed the paving for 2022. The manhole adjustments will continue throughout this month. For the Parks Department, wanted to 
a little special note that's actually not in the report because the report came out prior to this. But the agency um, or the Parks Department was the agency of the year for the Georgia Parks and Recreation District 6 for populations 50 to 80,000 people. And if you all recall, we received the same award last year because we were a population of under 50,000 people. It's unheard of for a city to get it two years in a row, but we did because of the shift in the in our population and the census. Um, we do have our wine stroll coming up on November the 5th, Veterans Day ceremony on the 11th, December 1st is the holiday lights opening night, and then on in January is our Martin Luther King Day of Service. Um, major projects within community, community development include the work for the new building at Campus 244, is expected to start within the next few weeks, the foundation for the new Buffalo's Wild Wing, and Hammond Drive was poured and framing has started there. Finishes are being installed at the P.F. Chang space at Perimeter Mall. Um, and also the Louisiana Bistro space at State Farm on Hammond. And the work for the food hall at Ashford Lane has restarted. So a lot of activities are going on in the community. The trail master plan process was kicked off. The new steps and the data with uh, new steps and the data gathering analysis. The department completed 535 building inspections and conducted 205 code enforcement inspections, including 12 vacant properties. This all result resulted in one stop work order, 52 warnings and five citations. Edge City 2.0 uh, public open house, October the 20th. Under information technology, that, that department consider, uh, continues to be one of our major backbone departments with many upgrades that are occurring within the computer system to keep up with the latest um, trends. The marketing department has uh, the fall 22 Dunwoody Digest has been delivered to the residents. Also, they spent a fair amount of time on GDOT's I-285 lane closures to try to keep the public involved in what, what's going on there and how that affects our area for the next several months. Finance department within this report is a link to the monthly financial report for August 22. Municipal court exposed to 506 cases. 42 cases were reset last month. Um, the department is also auditing old probation files to check the status and then clear out the ones that can be disposed of. The clerk's department continues to uh, do their boards. We had one alcohol license review board meeting, one art commission meeting, two budget committee, two citizen advisory capital improvement committee meetings. And we have another one actually of that coming up this Wednesday, two city council meetings and one urban redevelopment agency meeting. Human resources uh, and the wellness committee are planning or have done the NGO screenings for this month. Hopefully everybody took, was able to take advantage of the, that uh, service. Open enrollment will take place in early November. We did fill three police officer positions last month as well. Mayor, that concludes the city manager's reports. Thank you, uh, Joe. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, just thank you, Eric. Um, I know- um, Maybe up, speak a little louder, Joe, sorry. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, I think so. How's the Georgetown Gateway? What's the um, reasonable date for <laughs> seeing that project? Is it gonna be sometime the end of next year, 2023, Georgetown Gateway? Yeah, and Michael Smith's coming up too. He's going to give us some more detailed information on that. And I would add like part B of that, when is a road going to be somewhat put back together so it's a little bit easier to travel? So like maybe final completion and- I mean the plates removed? And the plates removed and, and just- Yeah, the, yeah the, the plates that are out there now should be removed whenever they, as soon as they pour the, the concrete caps on, but they're going to probably be more because they're putting in storm drain crossings every so often. And so they put the, the pipe in and then they schedule to have concrete placed and then they can remove the plates. So that'll kind of be ongoing progressing down the road. Uh, the whole project's scheduled for completion at the end of 2023. Great, thanks. Um, and Eric, for your next report or something, I, I'm looking forward, if you wanna, I don't know if you wanna chime in now or talk about the, we've been working with ARC of, of putting together the safe streets workshop. People talk about speeding, people not feeling comfortable, all the above, right? From kids walking to school um, to 
multimodal. But um, December 6th, we've, we've got that date. Do you mind just sharing a couple of sure. comments on that? Sure, Eric? glad to do that. Thank you yeah, so, so much. Yeah, so we have that date coming up, and uh, that will be a um, midday uh, workshop. We're going to have, this is also in partnership with our neighboring cities, as well as the PCID. We'll be a partner on that as well, and ARC. So this is going to be, uh, we have a firm coming in, uh, Tool Design is coming in to give us information about that. And it's an educational summit. So we encourage every, anyone who can attend to attend if that is of interest to you. And I think, I think Joe, we have about a hundred person capacity and it will be at the Dunwoody Nature Center um, for that day. Right, thanks. Yeah, it's gonna be at the Northwoods Pavilion. Uh, Peace IDs uh, gonna, gonna have lunch. It's, it's, so it's elected officials and staff and, and some free uh, key advocates in the local area. But, but again, everybody talks about you got sign posted 35 miles an hour and people are going 50, et cetera, uh, to um, I don't feel safe for my kids to even ride a bike on the sidewalk because of the speeding and the traffic and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think that's going to be a good value of learning what are the tools in the toolbox available mm -hmm. uh, to that. Um, and it also falls in conjunction with our um, a proposed budget with some uh, ARP funding for um, uh, positions, but we'll get to that later. But anyway, th thanks, Eric. Thank you. Um, anybody? Tom? Um, yeah, thanks again, Eric, for the report. It, it's always informative and always good to hear all the good things that are being done throughout the city. There's a lot, there's a lot going on, and that's a good thing. I just want, it's more of a curiosity on the police report. Um, there were two incidents that involved K-9, However, one was from Duluth and one was from Gwinnett. And I know we have two of our own canines. So I was just kind of curious why Hank and Ranger weren't involved in that. And, and we had a call in Duluth and, and Gwinnett. Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. With only two canines, we can't provide 24 seven coverage. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do have training, vacation days and things like that. So there's always gonna be a need uh, unless we just have one here all the time uh, to have someone. We go other cities mm -hmm. that have canines. When they, their canine is not available, we go provide that service to them as well. Okay, great. That's, I figured it was something like that. So it was, yep. it was the day off or they, they just weren't available when, when the incident happened. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Um, Tom, anything? Not Tom, Rob, sorry. God, it's Catherine. Uh, Eric, two kudos first. Uh, the Dunwoody Digest, I think, is an excellent publication, and I routinely tell Jennifer and Kathy, but I want to tell you as well, I think that is outstanding. Thank also, you. I fully appreciate the Waze update on the Spalding Drive closure. That makes, you know, traffic is never fun, but when you know what's happening, you can manage it. So thank you for that. Two questions of the police officer total now that three have been hired. Where are we in... Are, are we at minus five chief? Is that accurate or are you a little bit better than that? I think we're at six openings. We have a conditional job offer we did this week, which will bring us down to five. And then I have an interview with someone either tomorrow or the next day that could bring us down to four. And we, we have about three in background right now in the process. Okay. Ever closer. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And final question is about how you are bringing short-term rentals into compliance. What does that exactly mean? Uh, let me pull that one back up. Yeah, what we're looking at, and Linda, do you have anything on that? Any additional facts on the short-term rental? She has to come to yeah, the, yeah, sorry, yeah, you yeah. have to come to the microphone. Oh, come on up. It's something we were, we were looking at. We just say no, but, but it has to be on the record. I'm we were sorry. We looking at with Richard McLeod as well to try to get some different pieces. You know, this is a very challenging aspect of it. And the reason I was asking Linda to come up to talk about the revenue aspect slightly, but Sandy Springs has worked very diligently on this, but they have some ordinances in place, but I don't believe that the effectiveness is where they want it to be just yet either. So it is somewhat of a, of a challenge. I know from your standpoint, you and Richard have been working very closely on that. I thought you may have something to share since Richard is. Well, we, uh, they are uh, not uh, legal in our jurisdiction. Right. So we are wrangling with that. Um, there are different tools that you can use, whether it be consulting firms to help you find them. Uh, of course, they're not listed anywhere. I'm hoping that there'll be some legislative changes 
yeah. someday in the future right. to help us with that. But right now, um, they're hard to tell where they are. And Linda, one thing too, the majority of our re you know, short-term rentals are actually in rental units too. In other words, rental properties are you know, apartments. Well, that's places. where our biggest mm -hmm. problem is right now is in multi-unit uh, right. dwellings is that they're renting out their apartments and that kind of thing that you really can't track them down. So uh, I'm hopeful that in the future, there'll be more tools for help us to, to actually seek them out, but they are not legal in our jurisdiction and they are happening. Well, I understand that compliance is challenging, but when you say coming into compliance, do you just mean that the listing was taken down? Is that right? So what we're doing now is to, to add to your piece is we are doing a little bit more investigation on those. And when we see them, we do try to bring more into compliance. So they're, they're less than there were, mm -hmm. but it's still, it's unfortunately, I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge sure. for, for a long time. But at the same rate, there are, there are, there are less. Richard and his team of code enforcement are very diligent on trying to, you know, track them down and let people understand the law, basically, because not everybody understands that they're not, you know, they can't rent their piece. They probably hear about people doing it. Hey, you can make some extra money, rent your unit out, but that's not, it's not legitimate. As Linda yeah, puts it best, it's not legal within our jurisdiction. And, and mm -hmm. it is uh, code enforcement that's trying that's to, right. to that's see right. if they can search them out. That's but right. right now, like I said, there's not tools that will help identify where they are right now. It's kind of like if you Google it. So right And apparently, I mean, there's a pretty big demand, obviously, <laughs> you know, for the people who want to stay here and, and stay in those units just temporarily. Oh, sure. And it's just in, enticing, I guess, to people versus going to a, uh, a hotel or something else. Sure. So anyway. We'll continue to work on that, but it is, that's the, we're making headway. Thank you. You're welcome. So before I come, was that it? Wait, uh, Linda, please. So I have a question though. So it's not legal in Dunwoody for now. I mean, the, the reality is, is that every year the state legislature gets a little closer to taking away our ability to make this illegal. They are very interested in having cities have to allow short-term rentals. Um, and so but for now we are legally able to limit them, but are you getting tax revenue? Because that's part of what well, we do. And they are not making listings of the addresses. They're just giving they, you the even check. If we ask them for it. They're right. not giving us the detail that support it. So, so one thing to think about in places where it's not illegal or not forbidden by code, short-term rentals, um, they do require the owners to get business licenses which is allowed and is unlikely to change no matter what the legislature does. But um, I was just wondering, because one of the reasons that Sandy Springs, they go to chase the revenue, right? They're chasing the revenue and we shouldn't really, we get the revenue. That's what the legislature did. They made it where you must pay, um, where you must, where the taxes are coming. They're trying to appease municipalities and counties by replacing the hotel motel tax that's lost. For us, it's, not about that. And that's an issue. It's about neighbors running essentially boarding houses next door, which is what some Airbnbs turn into. So, and, and it, uh, you know, other jurisdictions have tried different things. Right. And so far, there's not a success story, sorry to say, but um, Shut, yeah. Yeah. To actually weed them out and find out where the addresses are. Like I said, we have asked for addresses and they won't provide them. Right. All right. Councilman Harris. Um, thank you. There was one thing missing from the city manager's report, and I just come, wanted it to note. Um, on September 20th, we had the death by overdose presentation by the chief. Um, you know it's a good presentation and a good um, seminar, whatever you want to call it, session, when you have two of your friends texting you like there and saying how phenomenal it was. So, chief, thank you for that. Um, and I know that some of the women and moms there were interested in you bringing that presentation to the high school. Has that been set up and is, is that in the works at all? Because I, I, I can't tell you for these two women to text me from the meeting itself, it meant a lot. Uh, it hasn't been set up yet, but I certainly will be working on it. Again, thank you for that. I know it was very well attended and there was a lot of passion in the air and they just, my one friend, she's like, I can't believe how much information there was that it was completely eye-opening to them. So thank you for doing that. You're very welcome. 
Councilman Hennigan. No, no comments on the city report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not have walked backwards. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Because I was going to go to you next. So one of the questions I have, it was a quite an extensive police report in the report. And so um, our new co-responder, is that working out? Yes. Is she providing some relief to the officers? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we uh, get a monthly report and uh, she has responded out uh, to the scene. We, she's actually had to, uh, you know, uh, 10, 13, a couple of people mm -hmm. on calls. Uh, she also does an extensive follow-up with people that, that, that we come into contact with. Maybe she's not there. So we have a referral process and then she's able to follow up uh, with the needs of the individual. She's had some success with that, some not so much success depending on the particular person, uh, but uh, definitely is uh, working out really well. And we certainly appreciate the council a lot allocating those funds for that. I actually had a meeting today with the DeKalb uh, CSB board mm -hmm. and uh, with the CEO of it. And there's a uh, house bill that passed last year that I'm sorry what's the CSB board uh, community service board Thank you. right um, and they run the uh, crisis center here in DeKalb County there's 22 of them across the the state uh, there's only there's only a few that are have one county and DeKalb is one of those some of them have 10 or 12 counties of responsibility um, but anyways, uh, uh, a bill passed last year that requires each community service board to establish kind of a, um, um, a committee that looks at, you know, how to provide uh, co-responder services uh, and, you know, get uh, people the assistance they need. And it actually, they're required to come back and uh, request funds. Uh, for that. So there may be some future funds allocated from the state uh, for this particular program as well. Yeah, so that's good news. Yes. Um, and so when it's when she's not here, the agency she works for is on call, correct? Yes, we okay. have a number we can call. If you need them. And okay. of course, there's other crisis lines as well, but right. we have that number we can call. And then if it's not an emergency, we can refer uh, the, the call or the case to, to her as well. Um, and so for purposes of a future meeting, um, Eric um, and Chief, I'd really like to hear what we think is happening with the drag racing or the car racing, or is it, what data do we have? Um, what are we seeing? What If there's a policy change, I know some cities are making policy changes to make it easier to prosecute, um, because whether or not it's drag racing, Dunwoody is very noisy at night. At least I live close to 285, so I'm never quite sure where it's coming from. Sure. And I know that it was seems to have been a pandemic habit hobby to make your car noisier. Correct. But um, if we could just get an update on what that situation is, because I, I know it's happening. And whether it's drag racing or not, it's definitely speeding, I guess, or just noisy cars. Well, certainly there's speeding right. um, and noisy cars. We have less... Uh, I would say what we have come to know is the drag racing or the people gathering to do that. There may be, there's obviously times where people do race, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not uh, pervasive like it is in some communities because of the, the way our streets are designed. There's just not as many gathering right. points where they block intersections and then all, you know, do all that kind of chaos. So we haven't experienced that. Okay. If we could just talk about it a little sure. bit with the rest of it the speeding and the noise sure particularly absolutely. that would be helpful yes i the drag racing that's happening like in sandy springs and brookhaven we don't have Roswell road or beaufort highway so we don't have the long stretches so thank you and then on the building permits i know richard's not here do we know where we are with arrive apartments have they gotten everything approved you can find out another time I, I, i'll I find out but i didn't realize I, but you wasn't here. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, last I spoke to Richard about that, they were starting to move people back okay. in there. So oh, I'll get it. We can get a full update on that because it's right. been just you know, it, just over a year. Is it seems like five hundred and thirty five inspections is a lot. If if it's not a, I mean, it just, I mean, I don't know. Does 
does that show like if every time they go out to Paris Baguette to look, is that an inspection and well, each one it counts? Be multiple inspections. Right. Because, so, okay. well, I mean, because they could be doing multiple inspections on one visit to one location. Okay. So it also could be a lot to do with High Street. Yes. And those things go Right. On. Well, that's each fine. Each little thing has an inspection. I was just curious. That's a good, good question. All right. Thank you, Eric. Welcome. Thank you. Do you read the next one or do I? Public hearing. Mayor Dorch, the next item on the agenda is a public hearing for fiscal year 2023 budget. Jay Vanicki. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Let me make sure first that I'm doing this correctly because I mess it up almost every time I come up here. Yep, messed it up again. Can you see it now on the full screen? Nope. We're going to work with it like this because I'll mess it up again. Um, I think you could just. Yeah, there's a. Button. I think if you enable editing and you activate maybe, yeah. or just at least enable editing, then you can run it as a slideshow, I think. No, nope. now we lost you all together. Now is it up there? There we go. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first public hearing. Uh, only one is required, and but we do two just out of, of habit here. We like to present and then do the next one. So we'll do a brief presentation and open up the floor for that. I'd also, before I start with this, like to point out that Linda Neighbors and Richard Plato, who carried all of the water on this, as far as I'm concerned, um, did a yeoman's amount of work on a budget that was tough to put together, um, are here to help with some of the questions on it. But I kind of want to give basically a budgeting 101 overview as we go through this this time around. Uh, just to start off with, okay, uh, per the city charter, this the budget's unveiled on Oct uh, the, oh, excuse me, I backed up one, all good things. Okay, the city charter says that it's got to be released on August 31st, 2022. So a lot of people don't realize that this is actually, we start work in, in late June, early July with revenue estimates and hearings internally with the city manager's office and all the department heads. Um, it's not fun work, but it's good work that we go literally line by line with departments on this. It's not just they throw a number up there and see what sticks. Um, the budget is scrutinized at the lowest level possible. People don't realize when it gets to a public hearing like this that you build at the smallest things. We will get to the point of discussing hundreds of dollars with a department that are smaller, where $100 is 1% of their budget. So we do get into that level of detail. It was proposed on August 31st. The budget committee actually met almost immediately, September 7th and 8th, to review on it. We also had the grants committee meet a little bit on this because a lot of this has to deal with the grants funding that we've got, and we'll discuss that later. Uh, the schedule has the vote to be on October 24th. There'll be a public hearing today as well as one as well as another one on two Tuesdays from now. Uh, there was also a public comment available at the Budget Committee, the Grants Committee, along with two September separate meetings. So it's back to almost what we did with bonds. We don't realize how many meetings we have until we're at the, the very last ones. Now, one of the things I'd like to tell everybody about is the budget is just a plan. Today is October 10th. There's still three months before this budget even takes effect, and then it runs for 12 months. The number of times the budget that you actually have in your hand will change is almost every single meeting you have. You will modify something in the budget. It might be a small thing. It might be a capital project. There will be also smaller movements that are uh, behind the scenes. So, for instance, between line items and departments. It's a plan to make sure that when we get to December 31st of next year, that we've been financially prudent in what we've done as far as planning. And I think the city council has taken great steps over the past few years for that. This budget contains the operating budget for 2023 and the capital improvement plan for 2023 through 2027 and the grants budget, which are done at a project level. Okay. One of the things to bring this out here is beforehand, the city didn't really used to do a capital plan like this. And this is, as I'm calling it, iteration number four, year number three. We add another year to it. So you can actually look at your constituents and actually say, this project said then 2027, it is budgeted for in the plan. Now, all things are planned and can be changed. However, it is 
reasonably expected to be done and completed in 2027. So you've actually done a five-year planning and you're just going to see we've started doing a five-year operating forecast. One other thing I always like to point out with that this uh, city does is we budget September 1st to basically the end of October, talk about it. So to debate a 12-month budget is done for two months. So you spend exactly one-sixth of the time developing the budget just at the council level. Uh, and the budget will be modified throughout the year. Now, this is one of the charts that I have happened to also share with some of our neighbors, meaning the other cities. Um, it is factual. And one of the things that's hard to compare when we compare cities to cities is the fact that not all of us get county services, not all of us act the same way with the county and the millage rates different. So we've cleaned up the rates on here. It's every single jurisdiction in DeKalb, the amount that this county would charge for that and the amount that the city would charge. Full disclosure, you see this little note that's Decatur 50%. They have had this messed up digest for years. They've done it at 50%. They're never going to change. Everything about that's about a little off, but it's good for comparison purposes. So what does this show you? It shows you the total tax burden in a millage form for every resident. Dunwoody is the lowest out of all of them by uh, the difference between those 0.25, okay? And that's really even a little bit misleading. It's another mill lower. We're the only city that actually knocks off one mill. I think Doraville has proposed it. They have not yet passed it. It's on their ballot. It's on their ballot. But we are currently the only ones that do that. So, for instance, our lowest of 39.233 for almost 95% of your homeowners, it's actually 38.233. Dunwoody is the lowest aggregate tax rate in the county. There is no way around it. When you compare it to us, we do have the lowest tax rate. Now, let's talk about budget development. And this is one of those things. I like to use the word parameters. Uh, Linda, Richard, and I argued with each other ad infinite about what are the parameters going to be. We'll take an infinite amount of needs and a finite amount of goods and get them to balance. So that's what we did. So we approached it with this. We wanted to make sure that all the department heads knew going into it that, you know, it's not going to be an easy year. But one of the things that you need to know is the background adjustments before departments even got it. Uh, In conjunction with the HR department, city manager, myself, Linda, and Richard, we sat down and the budget has a 4% market adjustment and also a pay range adjustment because when we adjust an increase like that, we adjust the entire pay range. And it's approximately 400000 is the cost of that. So that's what's built in, first pay period effective in the year. Now, the another thing that everybody in here needs to know is that right now we have about a 20% uh, budgeted amount of health care increase, the amount that the city covers in this. And that's becoming a lion's share of things. And this year, it is a big chair. It, it exceeds the amount that we're doing in pay. It's about 515000 now, this is to keep up with our own health care, which is a very good program, and I will have to say works for us in retention. When, when people actually go elsewhere, look, and they call back, and they go, okay, I'll talk to them, and then they realize your health care as a city employee personally is free, and then your family is at this rate, it becomes a, it becomes a decision-making factor in whether or not you leave. So it is a recruiting tool also. Um, right now, this slide has the final number could come in higher. Right now, we don't really think. We think 20 is going to be about right. And as a note, just as this is kind of like to give as, as a factual number, if you want to say about how much in benefits we pay for the average individual here, it's about $23,000 a year. So when you get your compensation for the a typical employee here, add in your health care, your retirement and the like, it, it, can, it can bring up the amount there. Um, some of this we're not going to go through in detail. It's, it's in there. And this is back to the capital plan. Uh, capital funding is one of those that we go through. And most of the lion's share is in public works with Michael Smith. And he works in conjunction with Richard Plato about trying to come up with a good five-year plan that can be completed in time. And what you see in year to year is first, he's got to add the new year in. The other thing we did here was we upped the SPLOS forecast a little bit. We are, as I'm going to call it, sales tax recovered from COVID. I like to use that very specific term. So we're feeling more comfortable about the projections on that. So we adjusted for real life equations on that. Other things affected with SPLOS are a little bit of public safety. Um, And again, we're going to talk about this at a later date, but the SPLOS will be up for renewal next year. Now, this is the things we haven't gone through, uh, particularly in the budget presentations in the past, and that's where the budget's going. And kind of like I do, king of pie charts here, but if you want to look from the top down on how the budget of 
Dunwoody looks. This is it at the fund level. It's the second level. So add up all funds together. Now go one level down. Half hour of our budget is the general fund. Every city, every county has a general fund. It's almost where everything happens. The difference between general and all the other funds here is the other funds generally have some type of restriction on them. We either segregate the funds for cash, uh, excuse me, for accounting purposes, or we segregate them for use purposes. So for instance, let's go through the other ones. General fund is about half the budget. SPLOS, the second biggest budget, is a capital project fund that can only be used to build things. That is most of our public works right there. The th uh, third one, the gray area, capital projects for us, currently we add very little to this budget each year. Um, it is mostly leftover host money that we're finishing spending. Um, the third one is ARPA, the American Rescue Plan. If you take a look at it, it's 17% of your budget this year. When we start to hear talk about a 20% increase in your budget, 17% of that 20% is federal funding. It's one-time funding and generally being treated as such. Now, we do have some things where we're looking at experimenting. So, for instance, the mental health counselor, which is one of those where I always like to say probably the best experiment that you could do with this money because in a real life world, general fund, you may not do it in this. Let's try it for a year or two or three. If it works and proves its weight, it'll do there. And I have faith in this one that it will do what it's intended to do because police officers have to respond a second time to a scene. If we can knock that away, then the police officer doesn't have to do that. So that's about almost 20% of the budget for this year. All the other ones are much smaller. They're the stormwater, which you can only use on stormwater construction, E911. The hotel motel tax, we have to put down here for clarity, but it, in essence, that goes straight to the general fund with a little bit more for the CVB and a little bit for construction. Debt service is technically double counting. It's also out of the general fund. And then the grants portion is the LMIG, the amount that we get for road resurfacing. Okay, now let's take that general fund, that biggest slice of pie, and let's break it into two different ways. I want to do the first one. Let's look at departments. As you can see by the graph here, out of your general fund, this is money that is 100% discretionary. In other words, the council is the final vote on where does this go. Basically, over a third of the budget, almost 40%, goes directly to the police department. That is the lion's share. If you added up the next four departments together in the general fund, you get to the same amount. That's how big... The priority is on public safety with this council. Now let's look at the second as far as discretionary, and that's parks and recreation. Now, again, we've all talked about, and we've been kind of circulating in, in town halls when we've talked, is that the Carl Vinson study did not envision a parks and recreation department that was 12% of the budget at $3 million. The city has changed. Its citizens are demanding more on this. The third one is public works, and I want you to pay special attention to its 10% of the general fund budget, because on the next chart, it's going to change a little bit. IT, you see down here at 8%, and one of the things to remember about certain departments, such as that and finance and administration, they are supporting almost all the work of the other departments. They're not their own. They don't have special other things. IT, their staff is in the police department all the time. They're in community development. They're in finance. Those are support departments. So when you start to look at that, where even it's smaller and smaller. Community development is the smallest, as I like to call it, out of the front-facing departments. Now you're into departments that we call transfer to debt service. So even if you the, all the departments are into the 2 or 1% of the budget, all these much smaller. So the lion's share of the discretionary funds of the council have historically gone to police, to public works, to parks. Those are your top three. That's where your discretionary money has gone. Now let's do another thing. Let's take a look at it, but let me add all funds together. Remember that 11% share I showed you for public works? It grows a little bit this time around. Uh, police shrinks just a tad as far as share. Um, excuse me, public works grows to 36% and police shrinks down to 23. That's because public works does a great deal of work with splost and stormwater. Therefore, when you add all funds together, funds that are not discretionary, public works is the biggest share of the thing. So you definitely know that this city has got two main priorities in it. It's public safety and it's public works, along with parks and recreation as a third, but with not, there's very little um, funding that goes directly to parks. It's just not the way it's set up in Georgia. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about common objects. Okay, common objects, we're going to get in geek accounting speak here, is 
the bigger categories when you're talking line item budgeting. And this is, your, this is what your general fund budget is mostly made out of. It's almost one half personnel cost. 47%, a little bit less. And then your next two biggest categories are contracted and purchase services and repairs and maintenance. And I would like to also say that repairs and maintenance is not necessarily patching a hole in drywall. There's a lot of contracts that we just are general maintenance contracts. So we're looking at a budget that's almost half people and half contractual work that is supporting those people. Then we get into the smaller things. And I always like to, to use this is supplies are 7% of the budget. Anyone want to take a guess what the biggest supply we purchase is? Mr. Price looked like he was going to guess. Yeah. It's gasoline. gasoline. So when people start going, why don't you just cut supplies? Well, guess where that fuel goes? In police cars. Okay, so we are getting into things like that when we start to talk on cutting the budget. When you start to look at things, get rid of debt, the contingencies less than 1%. Liability insurance is about 2%, which is about right for somebody our size. Okay, this is the next thing we want to talk about. It's a little bit on compensation. And this chart shows you the entire history of Dunwoody and pay raises for employees. There are three different colors on here. The dark black bar is called staff increases. The gray bar, I'm going to start calling officer detective increases. In 2001, we, uh, the city and y'all approved a pay grid, a step system. And I know th th the wording should be a little bit different on that. But though that caused a higher increase for a special class of police officers, most of the line staff. So we're always going to show that separately now, just because in those years it stuck out a little bit. But I want to show you it against an, a white bar, and that's inflation. From 2000 to about 2020, the amount of pay increases always, always outpaced inflation. And even when we got to 2001, the police amount- 2021. 2021, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, 2021, it, it drastically outpaced inflation. And, and the staff one was just, just a little bit behind with a little bit of makeup the next year. And then for 2023, we, of course, me and Jerome Powell are discussing this at length, cannot agree on what inflation will be next year. I think we disagree on it, but we just have the budget at the 4% in there. So this is to show to the public that the compensation, especially amongst public safety officials in Dunwoody, has been keeping up and outpacing inflation since the city was created, especially when we've had this newest little bump of the, of the past recent 18 months. So that's to put that out there for historical purposes. Now let's get a little bit about deficit spending and explain it. Okay, technically, a budget is balanced in the state of Georgia when the sum of all revenues and sum of all expenditures equal. It does that. However, it is what we call a structural deficit is what you have before you in the general fund. We knew that going into it. We knew that going into COVID. For 2020, for 2020 and 2021, we budgeted a structural deficit each year. In neither year did we hit it. In both years, we had a small surplus. In 2022, the year you're in, we think we might use a little bit of fund balance. So what we're doing is the current 2022 budget has it this way. And let me read the chart from top to bottom. You start the year with 22.5 million in the bank. And I know there's a certain person in the bank that screams every time I say in the bank, but 2022, 22.5 million at the beginning of the year. With recurring revenues, revenues that come on all the time at 26.6 million, recurring expenses of 29 million, and major one time expenses of 2 million. And for everybody's for a point of information, that's the Spruill Arts Center and the Dunwoody Nature Center's 1 million contribution. So it's considered a one time capital expense. So when you do that, the balance at the end of the year for the city's general fund will be $18 million, 18.1 million which means 7.46 months, seven and a half months. The minimum required by city policy is four months. And we'll always be, when we start to go out for bonds and things, these are the type of measurements they look against. So it is healthy, but the problem is that bottom number, the structural deficit of 2.4 million. In other words, recurring revenues and recurring expenditures have a difference. Now, when we do projections, that'll get down to about a million or so this year. This year, we might use a little bit of fund balance. The budget you have before you in 2023 is what you need to look at. We estimate it'll start with 18 million in the bank, earn 28.1 million, spend 30.1 million, which will leave $16 million. Now that $16 million is not a deficit. That $16 million is the ending fund balance for the general fund. 
which is equating to about 6.4 months, okay? Still robust, still healthy. However, that structural deficit is $2 million, a little bit lower. The numbers to the right are what you need to see and focus on. Recurring revenues increased 5.73%, recurring expenses 3.76%. Remember early on in the presentation, we talked about a 4% raise, uh, raise and 20% health care that totaled to a million dollars. Notice that the budget went up from the recurring expenses from 29 to 30 million. Just staying still has a cost increase to it, but they're trending in the correct definition, correct way. Revenues are outpacing expenditures. We need to keep this trend going, which is why when this budget was developed, we said we had a parameter. We looked at the forecast and we said, we're only going to spend at most 2 million of structural deficit. I think we're at 2.033, as we said, pretty close on the money right there. So we, we entered it knowing that's what we wanted to do so that for at least the next two or three years, we could, we could work with that. This is a chart that just shows what I've been talking about lately, is the budget when you passed it exactly 12 months ago had a structural deficit of 4 million. We cut that down to two, the 2.3 you have now, and now we have two. So we're expecting this 2 million to decrease later in the year. Again, our biggest source of revenue is property tax, and it comes from the digest. I, I talked to a lot of local economists, and none of us can project cities this small as tax digest. It's just the wind can blow a certain way. So we're still very conservative on that. These are the charts that we keep showing at all town halls now, and we need to focus on them. The one on the left is the year-over-year -year change of the tax digest for the city of Dunwoody. Every year since incorporation, and I fix a tax commissioner error in 2012, it balances out better, and it's, it's actually the way it was, just a certified document doesn't show it. But it also shows you that for us to predict this number year-over-year -year is a little bit difficult. So we stick around the two or three or 4% raise. Um, the second chart is the other one that we really need to focus on as a city. It is the amount of the digest that ex is exempted from taxation. We have two main tax exemptions here. We technically have six, but we have two that really affect the budget. One is the property tax freeze. The year you bought the house, you bought your house, you homesteaded it that year, your value has your value for taxation purposes has never gone up since that year. The second exemption is the one mil exemption. So what has historically been 2.74 or is now 3.04 is really 2.04. Those two are a line share of the budget. Now, where does that really play out? Look at the top blue line. That is the value of all homesteaded property and the exemption below it. We're up to 57% of the value is exempted. That is extraordinarily high. If you were developing a city from scratch, this would not be part of a model you would build. It's hard to find any, any of the current cities that have come up recently that have said, oh, we want to freeze the digest. It is half your digest is residential and churn when it sells increases something. So this is one of the things that we built 2023 knowing this number is not going to get better off of this. Now let's go into operating forecast. The city did the great step of creating a capital improvement plan. That was saying what we can actually build, what we can actually afford. Now we've started to get into the operating forecast. And to go through these, like each presentation we do, there's four lines to look at. It goes out for five years. Your, your black line is total revenues. And this is all just for general fund. Your red line is total expenses. Your green line is your end of year fund balance, amount of money made at the end of the year. And the blue is what your minimum should be. Currently, we're significantly above it. We're planning to use 2 million in 2023's budget. In 2024, we're, the projection still has it using a little bit more, but in 2025, it hits that 4 million mark. Everything on here is conservative. Revenues are conservative and we're assuming 100% expenditures. So 2025 is a year where we say, would happen that year and if something happens economically, could get worse, 2025, 2026, somewhere in that neighborhood. This is if nothing changes off of it. Now, let me change something. I want to show the, the original graph on the left and the new graph on the right. This is where it's talked about. To keep everything going, and I like to call it the golden number, if you're projecting five years out 
and you're hitting it on the nose, you should be in a different business like gambling. But in our five-year forecast, with a 0.6 to 0.7 mil increase in the next year or two, we will be above four months the entire time of the forecast. Now, that's, again, an estimate. It's a sensitivity analysis. It gives you an idea. Now, this does not allow for any increase in services. This allows for inflationary increases, um, an 8% healthcare increase, which is the normal, and 4% raises, which we permanently adjusted. It used to be three for like a decade, but we adjusted it at four. Now let's look at a different scenario. What if we did the reverse? Instead of increasing the tax rate, what would it take to cut? The cut would be about 5.9% in this year's budget or next year's budget. Both would, both would wash in, and it would still carry you out for five years. No extra adjustment needed through that time. But again, no additional services and no major rebids. Now, the third one I'd like to do is put a different thing in there. Put in an additional half million of new operating expenses in each year. The budget's about $30 million. So half million dollars is, as I'm calling it, robust expansions. We do have some undeveloped parkland that will open. We do have some major rebids in a couple of years. So when we start to look at it, instead of 0.669, it's 1.265 mils, basically 1.3 mils. At the retreat last February, we discussed about a 1.5 increase. And part of that was taken care of with the, uh, the amount this summer, the 0.3. So that gets in line with what we had about, uh, about a year ago off of that. Now, again, the proxy doesn't um, that we put in of half a million does include the ARP funding that we're talking about. Very little of that is ongoing, though some of it is, uh, the mental health counselor, potential ambulance services and things like that. So that's not taken into account here. We think that could be 0 0.2, 0 0.3 mils. It depends upon how it fleshes out at the end. Uh, budget committee did recommend three major proposed changes to the budget, uh, converting the contracted deputy community development director to city staff as a cost savings. Um, we've done that. This will be, uh, we lack one department. We've been doing it bit by bit. One of the things that um, is not really out there in, in most people don't know is we are still a heavily privatized city. Our four major departments, excluding the police department, are run through contractual services. That has created some dilemmas in it where we have the person leading the department is city staff, and if they're out, then a contractor is leading it for a while. And so what we've done is we said we need to make it so that there's a true oversight, someone that only has one master. It's And all of our contracted staff, it's just like working with there's no difference, and none of us here see any difference between them. But when they're a contractor, they have allegiance to both their boss that they're hired by and the city. So it makes it difficult for those individuals. Hence the, as we call it, slow process of looking at each department every year for staff that can or cannot be pulled in in-house. In some cases, it doesn't make sense. In some cases, it's an easy decision. So in this case, it became a financial decision. And also, we, we like the, the way things have been going there. We just need to have two city staff so that there, there's a good amount of redundancy in there. Um, second thing is changing 250000 of the funding for the Ashford Dunwoody Trail in the hotel motel tax to the signage project that we're working on. And to be honest, this has almost become a joke with staff because we go, we don't know which way it's going to go. So we just said, put it in one way and let everybody else decide. So the budget committee went through and said, that's the way to go. Uh, the third one is adjust the American Rescue Grant uh, plan funding, which is shown on the following table. And uh, at the very end of tonight's meeting, there's a discussion item on the American Rescue Plan. And just for discussion purposes, we can handle it here after the public hearing is closed also. But this is the chart uh, as far as it is. Just to show you, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we can go through it in detail after the public comments on it. The changes did this. It decreased the amount of funding for the recreational equity part from 1.5 to 1 million. That number was just, just a number to, as a holding pattern. It's no specific site, location. There's ideas. Uh, economic development was reduced to 200,000. It still has a significant amount of CARES funding that's still, still to be spent on that. Um, the public safety was rearranged, as I called it. It actually increased overall from 1 million to 1.1 million, but the new iteration has three years for the mental health professional, 171,000 for the license plate readers, and upping the potential EMS private uh, additional contract to three years at 200,000 apiece. Also, another program on here, Safe Streets position, a part-time contracted position to emphasize um, 
the um, safer streets, bike pedestrian safety, along with 750,000 of one-time capital, which can be used for smaller projects throughout the city, none of which have been identified. This would be a work in progress. Now with that, this is the big presentation for the public hearing. Um, at this point, I recommend opening the floor for comments. Thank you. Um, unless there's an objection, I will open the floor for public comments and we will do 10 minutes for if people want to comment. I don't really have to do the for and against, do I? Can I just have 20 minutes of comments on the budget? Is that okay, Sharon, or does it have to be? I think it has to be for. Okay, so sorry. So if you're for or have questions that lean positive, I guess, you may speak in this 10 minutes. Um, about the budget, and then we'll do 10 minutes of questions, of, of comments that are more negative, I guess, and um, that maybe questions that are more negative. So we'll start with the positive. Um, 10 minutes if anybody wants to speak uh, for the budget. You, you can come up and approach the, the mic, uh, the, the thing. Thank you. The word is the podium. I'll approach the podium. Thank you. I want to say bench, but no, that's not right. right. Yeah, it tells you how often. Podium. There you go. Um, I have a question. So what is the safe streets position? Um, sounds exciting, obviously, mm -hmm. in light of what I had to say earlier, but I'm curious to know more about what that means and what that brings and what sort of value having a position uh, like that brings the city versus I'm assuming it has to do with safe streets. I can't imagine most of us are getting in our cars being like, you know what? I'm going to be dangerous today. How is that any, how does that, yeah, well, I'm easy, right? but I'm curious about how does that, how is that value added versus having, for example, a police officer saying you messed up and here's your ticket and I'll see you on this date. I'm just curious. Okay. So we'll answer the questions after the public hearing part. Okay, cool. Or, or I was just curious. Thank that you. Was a question I had, so That's good. I wrote it down. Sounds Thank like a good you. Idea. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak for anything in the budget? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Hickey, I'm, it, the, the next section is questions and not, I not, I don't have okay, or, or, or feedback, feedback, thank you. I, I have feedback. Right, yes, sir. Um, Madam Chairman, again, I'm Bob Hickey, I'm a citizen of Dunwoody. As I said earlier, and as I said at the September budget mm -hmm. uh, committee meeting, I think this budget needs to be sent back, okay? It's an abomination of, we're, we're living beyond our means and the only reason i do all this stuff is for my grandkids my kids have made it to be able to live in dunwoody okay i have three kids and three of them live in dunwoody with their with their family but of my grandkids not a single one of them zippo are going to be able to live in dunwoody if we continue to drive up the cost of living in dunwoody like we're doing uh, i have three kids that are out of college they can't live here, okay? Uh, so so that's that's why I do this. The thing that I object to, the, the $10 million in federal money, there, there is no such thing as free money, okay? This money comes with strings, and that strings is, those strings are, at the end of these pilot programs, we're all foolhardy if we think these pilot programs are going to be able to, to go away, okay? They, they will be embedded, okay, in the budget, and we will have to live with the cost. And Mr. Vinicki is a, is a ghost if he thinks it's only going to be a little bit of money. It's going to be 3 to $5 million. When you look at all these programs that they say three years, three years, three years, and you divide those by three years, it's a lot of money. So I say send the $10 million back to Uncle Sam, and let's let people be able to afford to live in Dunwoody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more public comment? Seeing none, I close the public hearing unless there's an objection and I open it up for council comments and questions. Mr. Vinicky and everybody be ready. Um, John, do you want to start? Actually, I wasn't part of the budget committee. Can we have the budget committee report out and start at the other side? Would that yes, be that's fine. So, Tom, you were the chairperson of the budget committee. Now we're calling on you. <laughs> Any warning? <laughs> that's fine. Would, would you like my notes? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I mean, if there were specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But I can guess. I think um, we should. Th so, in the budget itself, you did y'all change anything from 
the city manager's recommendation. So those three things we mentioned during the during right. the presentation. That right. three, nothing right. else of significance. Nothing else. Okay, because usually that's where we report out is the stuff that's different, and then other feedback. Uh, yeah. So a lot, a lot of the change was kind of shuffling around some of that ARP money. We'd we'd come up with some initial allocations for that, and after discussion, um, pretty hearty discussion, uh, there were some needs and some programs that we thought uh, would be the best use of those funds. Um, and uh, for example, the public safety thing, uh, we, we kept the same amount of money in public safety. There, um, there, there, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, what we did is we, uh, we're gonna try, uh, you know, there, there was a comment uh, made about trial services and yes, we're, we are trying out some different things. I think this is a, a golden opportunity. Oh, I shouldn't say I, the committee thought it was a golden opportunity for the city um, to take to um, try and add some services that are really going to add benefit uh, uh, to the city. One of those is a, is a is a pilot ambulance service, um, and uh, for so for three years uh, we are working on the, the details have not been finalized. Uh, this has been proposed uh, that we'll have an additional ambulance station here. As as we all know, there has been um, ongoing issues with EMS response times and. Um, because of the way that is handled with the state, it's been a constant frustration to get that because we don't have control of that. That goes through the county and the, and the EMS zones, and that's a whole other story. But uh, we, we're looking to see, hey, let, let's try this and see if we can get um, quicker response times uh, for our advanced life support calls, which are the obviously the important ones, the ones that are, are life or death. And, and we will assess that ongoing. It, uh, it's not a a three-year commitment. If at the end of one year we say this is not working at all, it's a year-to-year -year contract. We cancel the contract. But if it is working, and it is our hope that these these pilot programs work and add value to our citizens, and uh, that was a, a very important uh, public safety issue uh, there. Um, the uh, the safe streets was 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 asked. Uh, we want to be a very walkable, bike-friendly city. Um, if we're going to do that. It's important that we make a commitment to making that as safe as possible. And uh, the city has done done some things. We heard in the police report um, about um, enforcement uh, with the VRU ordinance um, and other things. But uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is is look at projects to increase uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, basically, the smaller projects, not the big scale multi use trails or um, or anything like that, but basically looking at you know pedestrian improvement, crosswalk improvements. Uh, are there are there signal signalizations that we can use? Other things like that. I, I, I'm hesitant to call it low hanging fruit, but the but the smaller projects. Um, and quite frankly, our staff with with everything we have doesn't have the bandwidth to take on that and implement them. So in the short term, we're going to look at maximizing where we can improve pedestrian safety, um, increase the safety of our streets. Uh, bringing in someone that that will be their focus, and then just as important as having a person to come up with the plan is giving them some money to actually get those projects completed. So that so there was the the funding of the position, and then the funding uh, for for actually implementing the, the plan that they come up with. Um, am I? What, what am I? I think you've covered it. I think I, I, that was it. There was there were not a lot of changes. I do want to thank uh, Linda, Richard, Jay, and all the department heads as jay pointed out this was a very difficult budget to put together there there were cuts uh this was this was not a uh an easy task at all um so um there were things that were wanted that we were not able to provide because the funds were not there um so i i do think that everyone involved did their due diligence did a very good job in preparing and giving us and i think that's a testament to the fact that we really didn't require making many adjustments at all because they had done such a, a good job getting it to us in basically the form that we felt was appropriate to forward to the rest of the council. So thank you, Linda and Richard, in particular, and Jay, of course, as well. Um, uh, good job by everyone. If there's specific other specific questions I didn't handle. One thing that I wanted to add is that I think in the October 24th final version, we're going to, we wanted to have the sinking fund pointed out. So it's delineated when we, where where did we land with that? Because I know we have a meeting coming up to figure out how much we want to put in it, but I think that was very important for us to be able to point out to the public that we, when we raise prices for book run for rentals, we do actually have a fund so that when repairs are needed, 
10 years from now, we will have the money to pay for it. It, it will be in the annotated in the final version. That, that was something the budget committee felt strong about because we had told the public we're, we're doing this, we're raising prices so that we have this and we want to be able to point out for the 2023 budget how much is living in there already. Let me ask, Linda, we would reserve that. If, yeah. Okay, yeah, it would it would show up as a sinking fund reserved at the end of every annual audit, so it'd be full disclosed in every in every audit. Um, and I just kind of want to talk to the safe streets position. Um, the gentleman you asked about what would they do? You know, our police can't be everywhere all day. They're not all knowing. They're not all seeing, unfortunately. Um, and if you look in the city manager report, there was I think three auto versus pedestrian incidents, which is kind of high, but there were three different areas in the city. Um, so is there something we can do other than doing a campaign to stop driving like an idiot? Um, what else, what else can we do? Because a lot of it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's driver error being idiots. And so, but to put it, you know, how can we idiot proof our intersections and whatnot, um, for our pedestrians and bikers to make it safer? Yeah, I'll agree. I'll, I'll just tack on to that. Yeah, there's. A lot of it comes down to just individual responsibility when they're behind the wheel and that's and as as much we could have a police force 10 times the size of the police force we have and still not be able to catch all of that it comes down to individual responsibility however there are things that we could do through engineering through design that can increase the overall safety and reduce the number of incidents or chances for bad outcomes and that's what the position is going to be to find ways that we can make the streets safer for everybody so that that is the intent there and uh, hey, this is Joe. Just Joe, just chime in. Um, just Joe, you got to talk a little louder because it might be me, but I can't hear you. Okay, right, they um, say it's not just me. Go okay, ahead. Okay. Um, hold on. Let me. Well, just just me in general. Um, just the budget process in general. This is my first year on the budget process. Um, I appreciate having input. Um, everybody on council, you know, it's equal vote, equal voice. Um, I've asked people early on before the process even began. What were some changes? What were inputs, and so on? So you know, those things happen early in the process as well. I really am a great proponent of bringing in those contractors where it works, where it makes sense. Look at that net cost of savings there. Um, so that's great for succession planning, for training, for um, retention, and and so on. And and the safe streets is is key. We're where um, other cities um, have, they have transportation planners, right? We don't have a transportation department. We don't have a transportation planner. We have public works and we have planning. And it's the marriage of both of those. Public works is building those, you know, seven figure projects, moving rights of way, stormwater, all those heavy lifting things. And planning is developing those plans and working with community development and zoning and, and new developments and so on. Um, but it's it's the intersection between planning and, and how we move around and whether we get around safely or not. And um, I think we should live in a community that every child should be able to safely walk or ride their bike safely to school. And if a child can, then a 75-year-old or 80, 85-year-old retiree should be able to do the same to go to a coffee shop or the library. And it's, it's about engineering. So um, if you look at other cities, just, just other nations, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, they were leading in that effort um, 20 years ago, where they've set a, a goal to having no fatalities on their streets. And everywhere there's a crash, they want to minimize that and mitigate it and redesign our roads so that, yes, they drive at the posted speed limit or lower. Um, and that cars naturally stop when pedestrians come to a crossing and so on. So, um, and, and in uh, December, we're going to have this workshop um, of how to leverage all that together. So I'm really uh, looking forward to, you know, the city of Dunwoody leading all of our regional cities in the Atlanta metro area, cities and counties leading in this effort. Because I don't see another city um, doing what we're going to be doing in 2023, and we're setting this stage now for it. So um, anyway, thanks. Thanks all. Uh, Councilman Harris, did you have something else to add? It to did, and committee? I said this in the budget committee meeting, um, and Jay, you touched on it. You know, our health care costs rose 20%, which is a million dollars, which makes me very cranky. Um, that, and I, and I understand that that's just what it is. So I look forward to hopefully dropping it back to 8% because um, 20%, that's cranky. <laughs> that's a cranky level. So, but 
it is a, a benefit that we do need to provide and it is part of the retention. Um, I just hope that we can keep it at 8% um, in future years. If not, I'll get even crankier. Okay. Councilman Hennig, so that was the budget committee's report. Uh, Councilman Hennigan, would you like to go? Sure. I have a number of things. Jay, can you start at your beginning of your presentation? Go about maybe page five. I'm looking at the difference between Chambly, uh, between Dunwoody, Chambly, and Doraville in the sense of the uh, level of funding. Looking at the service delivery uh, statistics, I'm trying to understand the price difference on those. Um, Do you have the, any reason? Can you if okay. you can take a look? You don't have to answer it now, but when you look at the service delivery strategy, I'm trying to understand the differences between the two and what is the price difference. Your biggest difference when Dunwoody and for some reason Brookhaven and also Tucker are into the equations, um, there's bond, bonded indebtedness that's still county funded. Okay, so Chambly and Dorville don't have those, but we in Brookhaven do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I can double check it, but that's almost always the trigger. And Chambly and Dorville have their own 911 system. But we have, to, and we have our own. So but that I wouldn't be affected by this. But, this is property tax. Okay, no, not. Right. I'm just trying to understand. So the bond yeah. referendum, the bonds from previous bonds does make sense the, to me. The unincorporated bonds are for still cities that did not exist at that time. Just. And if you could double check that for me at some point, but that's the one thing I was trying to figure out the differences. So that does what you're saying does make sense to me on page six, the next page, you talk about the 23,000 per employee for healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, we're also adding an employee, then it's going to be a wash. Was that 23,000 for that health care? That, that, that's the net to give you uh, and, and for the public to understand when we do these municipal contracts, each position that the contractor provides has what's called a burden rate and a profit rate. So in general, most of them are charging between 80 to 90% when those two are taken, which is standard for the industry. When it comes back to us with healthcare and our pension, we're more in the 40 to 45 range. So there's, an, there's always almost a net savings when we get to converting a position. The higher the position, the bigger the savings. All right. And uh, in formulating the budget, have we formulated the budget on the theory that we are fully staffed or are we formulating the budget on what we are at right now or next month? Where are we at in the sense of all of the numbers? I want a fully staffed police department and I'm guessing council as a whole does as well. Is this budget formulated on a fully staffed city? It is, it is fully staffed with a known lapse rate because we have, I think we're at 80 positions in the police department that are authorized. So I think we've, we, we technically funded at 77 or 78. But with general churn in that, that's what we generally spend off of it. That's a normal budget in practice. And 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 if Chief Grow, if we fill all the positions, we will come to you the very next meeting to adjust as need be. All right, I just know that we're working towards that goal, and the churn hopefully is going down to zero. So, and to a certain extent, I'm a little worried on the philosophy of the funding. Uh, if you can go to about maybe page seven, one of the 2023 highlights that show capital funding. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, Looking at the second item, we're thinking about putting 1.4 million added to the existing 750,000 for the Peeler Road shared use path. Let me get Michael to explain that one. I thought we were slowing down our path development. I thought we kind of publicly told count told citizens that we were slowing down a little bit on the path development. Yes, uh, that was um, prioritized last, when the transportation committee met last year, and so and that's the closest one read, that could be ready for construction. So we put money in the budget next year for that. Okay. But what is or maybe Tom can answer or you the impact of the Path Foundation? We're not spending any money right now. We're not allocating. Is that correct? Uh, that, yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. But we are allocating in the budget one. Right. Uh, the allocating was the wrong word, but we're not putting out for contract. Is that correct? Or am I wrong? It, uh, it would probably be late next year before it would be ready to go to, to bid. So how does Second the half of the year? So the, but the PATH Foundation will have finished their work by then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next item, I'm also seeing the 500,000 for the old Spring House Lane. Give. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand that one. Explain that one, if you could, for me. That's a uh, gap there where the townhomes uh, mm -hmm. on 
Georgetown Square were built and they built a piece of path and then the townhomes on Old Spring House built path. And then we're building path up on Chamley Dunwoody. So this would be to fill in the gaps that would connect the path on Chamley Dunwoody to the Georgetown Square. Okay, so it's just the gap. It doesn't go up the hill. It doesn't go around. It doesn't no, go around 285. It doesn't do road. some alternative. That, that's still got to be figured out. Okay. Um, Jay, if you can go to page 13. For me, that's uh, looks like the 2023 highlights. There you go. That's the one. Your tax digest, you're expecting a 4% increase of the overall total valuations. Is that right? Is our taxes are being based on a 4% overall um, increase in valuation. Let's say, let, it'd be easier to say the revenue, overall revenue is a 4% than the tax digest itself, because we've got a little bit of other wiggling in there, but 4% for overall revenue. Okay, because I have grave concerns over the office evaluations, the office property taxes in the sense of occupancy and the tax rates that are going to be coming back and the appeals that will be going forward based on taxes. So your 4% increase that everything is based on, I have concerns over, especially when our home valuations are locked. So you can't use that in the valuation increase. Really, it's just the commercial. I can get you. I don't have the handy, but we don't just do it at the overall digest. We actually sit down and break it down in residential commercial exemptions, different types. And we knocked down commercial quite a bit off of it with what we would normally have expected. Um, I'm thinking we don't have a full 4% in there. It might be three, five or something like that, but it's also, and, and actually the better chart to show. Hmm. That one right there, the year over year, that's the, the better one because the other one was uh, personal services. The 4% or around 3.5 is a little bit below the past two years. This 2020 dip was due to court loss, but you're totally correct. And Calvin and I in the tax assessor's office have gone back and forth because it, it is a known factor. The level of appeals could definitely increase, especially as rents roll off and the like. So it is something we are super cautious about um and and know that it is a factor to be looked at okay again we're not charging we can't change the home valuation of the homestead we're not going to uh, change the freeze we're not going to change the one mill exemption so all of those we can't really count on any of those things changing and we're running a deficit which is risky uh go to number 17 if you could which to me is the 2023 highlights. Mm -hmm. There you go, that's the one, thank you. Um, we are structurally planning on burning res reserves below our four month emergency reserve by 2025. And this 2023 budget is working towards this problem, making it worse. On slide 18, it's asking for a millage increase. How are we gonna ask for a millage increase of this? 0.669, how to uh, explain that one to me if you could. Okay, mechanically, it's not, um, I'm trying to think of to ask for it. There, there's multiple methods with it and the council has been briefed on some of them is that there is a voter, a, an avenue for voter referendum on it. It's okay. also written in the code charter that a section that can actually be removed by council vote also. So there are multiple methods to it, multiple avenues to it. Okay, because the best of my knowledge, based on the charter, is that we really can't raise the millage rate without legally going to the voters. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I thought was in place. Mm -hmm. Slide 19. Um, so you're looking for an additional 5.9%. You'd need to cut, in order to equalize the budget, a 5.9% or almost $2 million cut. Is that what you're telling me on this? Here, here's a good way to do it. These two chart, charts, so something, and again, it's to get out five years in the future. Yeah. Two avenues are somewhere in the middle. Let's Goldilocks it. Mama bear, Papa bear, baby bear. The one, one avenue is basically a 0.7 mil increase in the near future to carry you out for five years. But people, when you say that, you're saying, oh, you just need to increase taxes. Well, I want to give the other side of the equation. The other side of the equation would be to cut almost $2 million, 1.7, 1 
out of a $30 million budget. It would be 6%. It would basically remove three or four of the smallest departments to do that. So it's to give the number is somewhere between one of those two or one of those two. So it's to show the sensitivity of it. All right, if we can go to page 22. Can, can I jump in? Can sure, well, just, just for a second. I don't have it in front of me because it's been some while, but there is a method besides referendum to lift the cap um, under the Georgia's home rule law. And I think we've issued an opinion uh, previously uh, to Jay. I don't want to go into details right now because I wouldn't, I'm not prepared to do that, but I don't want to leave the council with the notion that there's only one way to do it. I'm not suggesting there's, there's not a way to do it. That here's, yeah. So I'm going to try to go through this just real quick. Please, if I can. So, generally speaking, under home rule, a city cannot amend its charter through home rule if such an amendment is specifically prohibited by statute or is otherwise preempted by general law. That's found at OCGA 3635-6A. But here, there is no general law which requires a city to maintain its millage rate cap. Uh, the charter provision setting the millage rate cap is merely local legislation at 208 Georgia Law 3536, setting forth the original Dunwoody Charter. Although 3635-6 lists further matters which cannot be the subject of a home rule amendment, the removal of millage rate cap is not among them. The only matter listed in the statute which remotely touches the subject of, is action adopting any form of taxation beyond that authorized by law or by the Constitution. That's 3635-6A3. Removal of millage rate cap is in no way an adoption of a new form of tax, and the form of taxation remains the same. And there's some attorney general opinions on that that are dated, but they're out there. Because of removal of millage rate cap is not prohibited by 3635-6 or any other general applications or general laws, the city has the authority under home rule to amend its charter and ordinances to do so, although the city must follow a procedure at 3635-3 to amend both the charter and the relevant ordinances. This is the most straightforward and defensible means to accomplish that purpose. So there's a means other than voter referendum I'm not suggesting avoid the voters. I'm simply saying here's another option and the law provides for it. Uh, thank you for uh, raising that. Um, I'd love to see that in plain language and more importantly, I'd love to see that publicized as an option for moving forward because I have not seen it in a plain language, non-lawyer speak, nothing against lawyers, um, but I would love to understand it better. And I think everybody in the city would love to understand it better to know as an option going forward, when the city documents and the budget are mentioning a, a millage increase that might be needed to equalize expenses, I want to make sure that when I'm approving this budget that I understand what we're talking about. We go to page 22. It's the uh, 2023 committee changes. Um, looking at the uh, recreational, it's a reduction, recreational equity in the economic development. That's a big reduction in economic development. I don't think Michael is here today. Was there any reason that it was such a large cut? Was there something else that happened there? In, look, in looking at the overall plan for it, and part of it's all, all budgets are prioritizing things, the committee, and, and please, if I, if I misspeak, say so, um, started looking at the additional of the safe streets position and the like as a higher priority than that of economic development, but it's also a work in progress. The second thing we've got is the economic development plans. It was like the recreational equity it was just the number and we were fleshing okay. out plans. And, and and also just just to add to that, one of the, one of the other discussions why we felt we could take some money from there is some of that economic development plan um, uh, is going to be partnered with Sandy Springs. So Sandy Springs will be contributing. We, okay. we, we are hoping so to get participation the, from Sandy Springs on that. So it might have been the entrepreneurial aspect of it. E exactly. Thank yes. you. Perfect. All right. Uh, I saw that the police went from a million to a million one. You laying it all out. The 600,000 for the EMS. Love the idea. Don't know enough about it. Is it only a capital expense? Is that 600,000 for it's the rent? Essentially, right. it's a lease, but it's, it's, a lease. it's not really a lease. It's a contract and we are not there's this is a number 
Okay. We're still in the early discussion day. So this is a ballpark throwing money out and to see what happens. No, it's a ballpark putting a line item in the budget so that once we get numbers back, okay, we at least have somewhere to start. So we may budgets are fluid and we may have to change it if the council decides that's a priority. Sandy Springs does something similar. So we based our right. funding based on what Sandy Springs is currently right. paying. It's a good one. Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to understand if it's capital once or is it ongoing or what? No, I tried next? to be clear. I tried, I offered capital, right? I said, right. in That's case close. anyone up here doesn't know, I mean, I would have had to have council approval. I said, I will take whatever it takes of our ARP money and I will purchase the rescue vehicles for the Dunwoody fire station and staff them as a pilot for the next few years to see if that improves our response times and the cab county fire told me no uh, well I'm, I'm good with the number i just wanted to understand if it's, yeah, three, three year it's a three yeah all right let's look at the uh four hundred and fifty thousand four hundred fifty thousand dollar addition to the budget for a three-year safe streets position it's a lot of money i didn't know that public works needed another employee that ask hasn't come from public works or through the city manager so i didn't know if that was an actual need from the city that being said i can think of have we finished the sidewalk plan of all the sidewalks were the initial idea since up and down dunwoody club and numerous other places no that money could go towards all every sidewalk there uh, we have all of the streets near schools. Uh, we are getting lots and lots of email regarding Chestnut Elementary. Think of all the crosswalks that need Hawk systems. So between that 450 and the 750, I can think of 15 different places to probably put that 750. I'm not sure I need the person to tell me to do that. But if Public Works tells me they need a transportation planner, and that we have three-year money coming from the federal government, then I need to make, basically understand from the department, which I have not heard whether that's needed. Michael, do you have a few minutes to talk about that? Let me, the city manager, let please. Me, yeah, I'm trying to understand just the need. Just to be clear, it's my budget. Okay. So Michael can come up. The sense that I have, and Eric can elaborate, is, is that these are above and beyond these projects. I think... Michael can come up, but I think the Public Works has 30 something, is that right? Active projects or something you said once. And, and while he's coming up, right. Mayor, the um, in this particular project, the way we designed it, it goes into community development because it's it's a hybrid position. That it's parked in the community ve development, but it is a planner type position to help come up with some ideas out of the box for pedestrian and other safe streets type positions okay um the construction money of course then is transferred over so it's transferred over so to michael smith department public works because that's who has to implement that bricks and mortar portion of it the salary portion of it though is a hybrid position and there's been a vast amount of um, discussion internally with my staff to decide how that position needs to be structured um i don't, I don't want i don't want to put micro in an awkward position michael you're free to say whatever i don't Right. He went to Georgia Tech like me, so he's okay to say whatever. But uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, the um, the Safe Streets position is kind of a, it's an extension of the planning piece of it to have a kind of a softer approach than a, than a stronger engineering approach to some of the Safe Street items. Um, that's how that's designed. And as the mayor mentioned, it was something that, that she bought into as well. But the structure of it is that I have to help manage it between the two directors. So that's what I'm saying. It is there. I've assured Michael it's not a, in any way a, a negative to his department any more than it's a positive to Richard's department. And so it has to work together as a whole between those two departments. But I hope that answers your question. Michael, feel free mm -hmm. at the pleasure of the council to say anything you'd like. Yeah, if he has anything. If not, you're fine. <laughs> okay. All right. A uh, little bit more, not much more. Um. um John, just a point of privilege. Um, Please. I, I've emailed the description out to you, and we discussed that over lunch uh, several weeks ago as well. So um, it came from several people. So I'd, I could have an offline conversation with you further, or we could do it here in the public realm as you wish. Again, I'm just trying to understand. Thank you, Joe, for that. If you want to speak after me, feel free to add in. Um, there's an item in the budget that's a line item, which was a little bit concerning. I guess the budget committee mentioned it as well. 
There's $250,000 for a Dunwoody swing at a soccer field. Is that still in our budget? It looks like it's still in our capital budget at 250,000. Mr. Starling's not here right, today, he, Jamie. Not, you can... And I can, I can address that. The, um, the Dunwoody swing, you know, that the actual exact location of that has not been final, finalized. We discussed putting that in a, in a couple of different places. You know, everybody has a different opinion on how that should go, but part of it was our big marketing package and part of what Michael Starlin had been working on, which was to have some more, um, you know, identity. And we had this Dunwoody, big Dunwoody sign. I believe we went over the dimensions. I believe it's 60 feet long yeah, in correct. total. And part of that had a swing built into it. It's very unique. To me, you all have to really decide, A, if you all want to do it. But if you do it, where exactly is the most is the best absolute location to hit the nail on the head on what you're trying to achieve with that particular piece. But yes, that is part of this, of the overall package of where we're trying to move forward as a city with some of these things. Jay, did you, uh, did you want to mention anything else? Yeah, on you're the, good on that. Okay. Michael yep. just walked in. Oh, there he is. There's the uh, Michael Starling. So he can address that at the, if it's okay with it. Sure, by all means. Does We're mentioning the, the $250,000 Dunwoody. And John signs saw it, it, indication of a soccer field or something. I saw it located. So it was mentioned that it's going to be located in the soccer fields in the back of Brook Run Park. Um, and, so, and it's in the budget for $250,000. Yeah, so part of the gateway um, signage program we did with Discover Dunwoody had in it a placemaking signs. And one of them was the Dunwoody swing sign. So um, it's been in there for a long time. We had a discussion with the budget committee about should we budget more money from the hotel motel tax for the trail or could we use some of it for the swing sign? The budget committee decided to put 250 in for the swing sign. Uh, we had an idea of maybe putting it in Brook Run, um, but there was some conversation um, about putting it over in perimeter. So we're in discussions right now with the mall and some other areas. So we will see uh, if we find the right location and we'll, find out if it's actually going to cost 250 or a little less or possibly even more. So that's where that came from. But no, it was never designed to go back by the, uh, the uh, soccer fields. It was possibly going in the, in the big field up front, but I think the idea, yeah, is that it should be in perimeter and somewhere around the mall, around Ashford Dunwoody, uh, around a location with high uh, visibility. And, a lot and was of that coming out of ARP money? Or no, it's hotel motel. That's money. hotel, yeah. motel. So it's just money. moving. It, it would have been designated to go more for the trail, but the but the budget committee felt like let's make a use some of it to make a big splash. And again, part of the gateway and wayfinding program. And then I'm looking at the long term budgeting, uh, the capital budget uh, line items. I'm seeing the four hundred fifty thousand in twenty twenty three for uh, the Winter's Chapel multi use trail. Um, Again, I thought we were slowing that down. The same thing with the, uh, let's say, here's one. The Vermac Road, it's uh, for ADA improvements. That's the $500,000. That's in front of Dunwoody High School. That was approved, I believe, by council. I may have voted against it, but that was, okay. I'm just going through. I'm just trying That's to understand. That's not a trail, what no. right? That's the trying to get the site safer sidewalk access for people with disabilities. And if we don't get the temporary easements that from was... Dunwoody High School, then it'll go back into. Right. Okay, so we, we don't have the final plans on that yet, right? We have. No, I... There's no one to have it. I don't know. The... Michael Smith, do we have final plans? Do we have any design? We do. Okay. Yeah, right. That was the one that was presented and that's the path option in yeah. front of the high school. Okay. Yeah. And we're, we were about to start um, talking to the school system about right away. All right, the final thing, oh, two more things for me. I saw that the uh, beacons for Chestnut and Perimeter Center West were in 2024. I don't understand why we have to wait that long for capital improvements for, especially the one for the school system mm -hmm. for the kids. Is there any way we can move up that capital improvement near Chestnut Elementary where we must have had 30 different emails and people and concerns? Yeah, we had the design uh, in the budget for both of those for next year with construction the following year. Um, you know, if we could move it up to construction next year, we'd have to move something else back. Or so basically your manpower for design needs help in order to move it up. 
No, I, I mean, we can, you know, we'll get it designed uh, sometime next year, but the funding for construction was in 24. So if you want to move that to 23, we'll have to move something else back out. Um, or ARP, or we could use some of the pedestrian money, right? And, and also just on that, since it, it'll be under design midway through next year, we'll be halfway through the budget. And if, if it's finished, I'm just randomly making up June, we can readjust budgets to make sure that it becomes sooner rather than later. But could we start the design? I'm, Eric, I'm just asking a question. For stuff like that, I, I realize design costs money too, but could you start the design now so that we could get it installed? I mean, any, I'm just any hypothetical project, or do you have to, does the budget have to go into effect to do the no, design? We'll, we'll go back and look at whether or not we can amend something. Right, I know, I know that's exactly where this pedestrian goes. safety pr person came from. Final last thing for me is on uh, the budget, uh, it shows $100,000 for the West Side Connector. A concept plan. Michael, we're still working the West Side Connector. We're putting $100,000 toward that this year. It's in the capital plan for 23. Um, I'd have to, is that in the hotel uh, motel? Or the... It's under public works long term plan for 2023 project 16I. Okay. Uh, yeah, that. No, that might be, um, so we had some grant money for that project. We are still working on, on that interchange as far as making sure that GDOT, when they do the managed lanes, doesn't box us in. So we're still working on that, but there's um, a couple of things out of that study that we, we have some grant money left over to modify the crosswalk at Hammond to make a bigger refuge there and take out one of the left turn lanes. So that we may need to use some of our own money to make that happen with the grant money we have. And then we're also working to um, secure the right, the, define the exact right of way that's needed where the new development's going in at Ravinia. So we preserve that right of way. Okay. Thank you. Again, I'm just reading the uh, staff memo coming to council about the concerns over funding and the way that we are working a, a, a structural deficit. And yet with projects that are costing big money that the citizens uh, that I thought we might be slowing down on, looks like we're still funding. So uh, I had some concerns in the budget, but uh, thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. For okay. Uh, Catherine, do you have anything? Yes, I would love to understand philosophically the structural deficit. I don't, is that, best practices for a city. Is there a reason to draw down the fund balance? Do you want to stay closer to the four month minimum? Here's the best way. You want the philosophical discussion, I, Plato I or Aristotle, we can go either which way. Um, uh, here's the best way to describe it. When most cities that are our size try to keep it exactly in line. When the pandemic happened, we put a screeching halt to expenses. All the department heads here is just shut down. We didn't spend. Normally, we would have come at the end of 2020 and said, here's some extra money. Let's build some capital things. And then of 2020, you could have not gotten Linda, Richard, and myself to propose anything because we were unsure. So we built up a much higher than usual fund balance. We would tend to keep it at four. It is appropriate when you've got that high of a fund balance, as long as you're planning it out and recognize when you will go below it. It is, it is acceptable to go through that. It just is always full disclosure, acknowledge it, know that you are two to three to four years away from something else happening. Now, again, everything's conservative in there. If it goes back a little bit better and we're here 12 months from now, it'll be maybe it's 2025, 2026, but you need to be aware that it's coming in the future. The other good thing is 20 in 2020 and 2021, we did not run a deficit in the general fund. Even if we just run a million dollars off the budget of, of deficit this year, it's a it's significant, but it's totally manageable. What you have to do is start taking the steps now without disclosing it. Then if council wanted to, and I'll just put something out there, go from 4% to 8% raises for everybody. We're saying, look, you're taking this thing that's three years away and making it a little bit worse. So the thing, the part of this is the beginning of disclosure of it. Is it permissible? Yes. 
Is it a perfect practice? No, but it is a practice that can be used, yes. Thank you. Bob? Um, first of all, thanks, John, for your um, there a lot of detailed questions, some that uh, you got that I now don't need to ask. Um, I do want to look at your, your um, presentation, page 17, where you're projecting uh, revenues and expenses beyond just next year. And I guess get the thoughts or um, maybe some input on how you address the commercial portion of the uh, digest and, and predicting um, income from that. And specifically, just thinking, you know, High Street's going to come online in 2024, you know, some of the other big developments down in perimeter and how those get factored into our projected revenues. It is, it is, uh, I'm going to be crude about this, not as fancy as it seems to be. Um, everything's almost done at a lower level than aggregate. So we break, break down the revenue into the common objects that we talk about. So it's other words, the um, top 10 or 11 line item revenues probably represent, I'm going to guess about 70 to 80% of all revenues. The others are just, it's a straight line, just up at a percent a year. We start looking at all of them. When you get to the parts on the bigger developments, such as high streets, we leave them off of this. Because A, we don't know what the final valuation of a completed project will be. I've been in the business long enough to know that a developer will say we're building a $100 million building, but when it comes time to assessment, oh, it's just $50 billion, you know, for tax purpose. So we do not put the big jumps in there. Uh, community development and I have gone through uh, looking at permitting over the, over the life of Dunwoody and realized that we are very good about a little bit of growth thing, a little bit like that, and we ignore the things when we're doing the development of the forecast. I guess I'm just thinking there's a potential for our structural deficit to, to fix itself to some extent just from commercial development we have coming, um, which would be really nice if we could boost, it would boost be that nice. side. Uh, but, uh, but to me, that's, that's the big question. You know, John raised concerns about um, reassessments you know, from, from COVID occupancy and, you know, weighing that against new developments coming online and, you know, adding tremendous, I think, value potentially to the digest and trying to predict where that might play out, um, you know, I think is, is very critical for the next few years. Agreed. Um, and that's really the only question I had, which is kind of trying to forecast that portion. Oh, anybody have other questions? Um, okay, so I just wanted to ask maybe a question or two or... Um, and so the healthcare costs, which jumped 20%, if I remember correctly, they had been kind of flat the few years before, correct? Not, not um, explain that. So a few years ago, we went from, uh, we did switch vendors. Okay. We actually went, so it actually went down. Right. The level of the coverage increased, I mean, right. Stay the same. quality increased. Okay. And then the cost was reduced. And then it was stayed on a tip, a standard increase, as I would say, industry standard or less increase. We do use a broker mm -hmm. that helps to get negotiate the price. At first, they came in at thirty something percent, so we got it down to twenty um, for this for this cycle. And you know, who knows what right. where we go next year? But at the same rate, this was a major adjustment, which comes to time from time to time. We also do shop the rate. With other companies to look at other programs, so we don't know, we don't just take whatever rate comes down right. um, down the line. But that's you are correct. There was more or less of a flatter curve in the right. past several cycles. So um, okay, that just had written a note about that. And so um, the elephant in the room is that this isn't sustainable unless we increase revenue or cut cost. We know that every person up here understands that. Um, and, you know, I have concerns about what's going to happen with our digest that have become more acute concerns in the last few months than they were even a year ago. But we also have some really positive things happening with Campus 244 and High Street. There was another office building that was coming and not, but they might be back. There's, there's new construction uh, and some of our existing properties are doing very well. So there's some hope that we will be able to offset some of the losses from that. Um, but we are going to have to have a conversation with our citizens. We've started the process. I haven't shied from that. We've had a series of public meetings. We're going to have to have a lot more conversations as we move forward as to what kind of city we need to be 
the opportunity that ARP, which by the way, if we give it back, it's not going back to Uncle Sam, it's going to Governor Kemp. And so, but if we, we have issues that we need to address, two of which are ambulance service, which is, we struggle with, the cab cannot fix it. Um, the times we've had crisis situations and we're gonna see, we're gonna pilot it and we're gonna see if we can make it better. It is working in Sandy Springs. They are, pay, taxpayers are paying for it in Sandy Springs extra. It's working in Sandy Springs. If it works here, then at the end of this funding, we have to have a community discussion. Do we want to continue it? Do we not want to continue it? The same is true in some ways, the co-responders, which is maybe the most important thing we're funding, is in some ways mandated by the state. You know, they're telling departments to do it. DeCab has Community Service Board, which a year ago had 25 open positions to fill. I can't even imagine what it is now. So we could depend on DeCab, which means that every police call in some nights, if at least Last time I asked, there are some nights where almost every call has a mental health component, which ties up our officers because ironically, they're waiting for an ambulance to come to transport the person. And so, and then sometimes the ambulance won't transport the person because there's no mental health person to say that that's the right solution. So we've combined these things. We're funding it for a few years. We'll come back to the taxpayers. We'll have data. We don't have data yet. We've been doing this for a month. We'll have data from the ambulances. We'll be evaluating if, if we even get to do it, if we can even work it out for the EMS stuff. Um, if, if we can't work it out with DeCab and we need other solutions for EMS, we will have that conversation with the public. But public safety is our number one responsibility. And in the last 18 months, we've raised salaries almost 21%, 20.5, something like that. And we have to be competitive. I see people say on social media, well, just don't play the game. Well, first of all, we should compensate our officers appropriately. And secondly, every department in Metro Atlanta is hiring. So we have to, it's just not even, it's the right thing to do first and foremost. It's at, and then we need to support them, which is, and it's, not a game. it's not a game. I mean, I literally had someone on social media say, well, if everyone stopped playing the game, well, it's not a game and it doesn't work that way. And so we have to be prepared as a community to have big discussions and make hard decisions. And that's what we're facing. When the city became a city, the Carl Vincent Institute study that the city chose to use, though there were other options in the study, said we would have 20 police officers. You talk about the parks being much larger and we have a lot more parks and you know, for what the city initially funded, we could basically mow the grass, but no one envisioned, and, and we didn't start with 20 police officers. We never only had 20 police officers, but that's what the city was built on. That's what the, the yes, we can do this was built on. So this is the beginning of a discussion, just as it was last year. Um, we have to figure out what kind of city we're going to be, what kind of community we're going to be, and we have to watch our dollars and cents. And this could be, I mean, we could have to make big changes very quickly as a result of what's happened since the pandemic. We just don't know yet. And so, but but we will have tremendous public conversation about what comes next because we have to figure out, there's a lot of moving pieces. Not only did the Carl Vincent study say X, Y, Z, the people that live in Dunwoody, many of them are demanding more. They want to know why X, Y, Z, Many, many people in Dunwoody have very low property taxes because everything is frozen and the, the mill. And so there's a lot of talking we need to be doing. There's a lot more talking to be done. And I look forward to those conversations. I look forward to the public feedback. And I, I think to your point about the money and the capital budget, as you know, we don't, we save to spend. We may choose not to do projects and just reallocate funds. Um, and things also take forever, as we've seen with the Georgetown project. So with that, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? So I think this concludes the um, budget 
portion of the meeting and we will see you again in two weeks. Yes, and just to, uh, to let everybody know at the end of the agenda for the yes. council, there's an item for ARP discussion. Yes. Just for the public, we will assume it has been discussed here and there's no discussion at the end. Well, what, the is this the one about the uh, nonprofits? No, no, the ARP amendment. We oh, the amendment, the changing the budget. Yes, yes, no sorry. Have that discussion no, there's, does anybody have any questions specifically about the ARP change or did everyone get those asked? Did anybody? Right. Right, this one just asking in case someone. All right, thank you. No, no, sorry, well, at the end, which we'll go through the stuff pretty fast. At the not at yes at the end of the meeting so just yeah okay consent agenda um does anybody have any questions or comments on the consent agenda madam mayor yes i was not in attendance at the last meeting so if that could be duly noted um and For i the believe minutes. Uh, if in the minutes that i was not at the meeting but, but that being said i think the uh, councilman somebody else was missing seconder was missing seconder well. was missing just fyi so right. i will move to approve with that note okay Second. Uh, moved by John, second by Stacy. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimous. Thank you. Joe, I will try to remember to do hands next time. All right. Sharon, do you have to? Sorry. The next item on the agenda, Mayor, is approval of the 2023 City Council Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals meeting schedules. And this is my item. I just drafted every year in conjunction with community development. So the schedule you have in your packet, all holidays um, have been and conflicts have been taken into consideration. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. I just want to bring up something for discussion. This is an action item tonight, but I want to point out something because it's a change. And some of us have been on this council for a really long time. So starting next year, Eric, it looks like Columbus Day is a holiday. That's right, that's right, Mayor. What I don't need an explanation. Do. I just, yes, want, to, that's just correct. want to clarify. Okay. And so right now the plan is to meet this next month, October has next year, October has five Mondays. So the plan is to move it from the third to the third and the fifth Monday, which one question is, is does that negatively impact the budget process? No, we'll be fine with that. Process. Okay. So, but I want it to give council some options because we normally meet the second and the fourth Monday. There, there, these are the options as I see them. And so, no, let me start over. So my first question is, is does anyone object to the uh, thir the schedule is published in October? That's the biggest change. Does anybody have a problem with that? Okay, so then never mind. That's fine. Because <laughs> if someone had a problem, I had alternates in mind. <laughs> but if no one cares, if everyone's comfortable with this plan, then we can leave it alone. So, um, and so it's an action item. Oh, wait, questions. Yes, questions, sorry. Yes, go ahead, Catherine. I looked at the holiday schedule versus the state, and it looks like you're now following the state schedule because the April 7th is a state holiday. It's Good Friday. Is We're taking this holiday because it's a state holiday? Well, it's it's a state or in, uh, a federal holiday. It is and not a federal holiday. Not a federal holiday. This is April 7th. Oh, April 7th. You're talking about the, yes. That is a state, when that was added, several years ago we, under a different administration. And that's how that got on there. Okay, that's, but we're taking it because it's a state holiday? The it wasn't here when the yeah, decision no, right, was made. It right. Was, we've been yeah, taking not, April 7th. Okay. Yeah, we've been, been taking Good Friday or right. whatever day that is. That's right. Yes. That's correct. I guess, again, it's still, are we taking it because of the state or are we taking it because it's Good Friday? Just, oh. <laughs> that's question. I, it, it was originally put on there by, by a prior administration because it was Good Friday. Okay, and then October 9th, are we taking that because it's state holiday, a federal holiday? Is it Columbus Day? Do we need to call it Columbus Day? It's a federal holiday, I, I understand. Does it need to be Columbus Day? Is it 
possible to be Indigenous Peoples Day. And, and that's fine because that's how it's actually listed on a lot of calendars as well. So are we making that determination? This you sounds like can. this is right. this calendar right. for this coming year for our city and our choice. Yes, that... it's y'all's choice. Yeah. Feel free to rename. Feel free to rename. And we don't always name anything. We just put out a schedule. So in other words, we don't explain what each of the yellows are. We just list them as days off, I guess. But I'm all for calling it. And, and, and yeah. Well, I would be a proponent of that. Okay. okay. We can certainly. But is that an administrative decision? I mean, it's an administrative piece, but we can certainly put it on there. And that's how it's listed. Like I was looking at my little calendar in my office, and it's how it's listed both ways on right. that calendar. So that's not a problem. Right. If that's okay. what y'all are more comfortable with. Well, that's, that's my fine. opinion. And also, if you're gonna if you're gonna name everything, then I would name maybe April seventh as a state holiday. Okay. Just sure. Instead of a religious. Yeah. yeah. As no, 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 we just we don't move meeting. the meetings. Okay. We, yeah, City Hall is there. open. City Hall is open. Okay. Question. Yes. Uh, 2023 is an election year. Sharon swearing in. Did we change it? Was there some change about swearing in the first council meeting, first Monday, January 1st? How did, what was, do you remember? And I'll be glad to address yes. it. No, that's a, yeah, that's, a, but it's an excellent point that needs to be addressed right. because historically, you know, when the city was first, of course, I wasn't here, but when the city was first formed, swearing in was prior to, so there were council members on board come day one. Right. Since then, a lot of the, a lot of jurisdictions will have the swearing in the official day can occur at the first meeting, the first business meeting of the year. Another alternative for that, I would say, is it can be done, you know, sometime after the election cycle. Because part of that, part of that process is it's not just the legality or the, or the formality. It's a time for, you know, for the newly elected person to be with their family and, and have the judge of their choice swear them in and different things of that nature. So it would be great to have it solidified. What we did the last time was we had it done at the first meeting in January because the, the concept was that the person was still serving, your, your current person was serving until that meeting date. Of course, everything creates a few, there's, there's a plus and minus no matter how you do it. It's really what you're comfortable with. What I didn't want you to have to do is have a special called meeting just for that single purpose. So you can have it ahead of time where it's effective at the stroke of midnight. So in other words, you could do it in December because we already know by that point, even if there were a runoff, it would be the first, second week of December. So you could do it late, the latter part of the month or do it in January, which is what we did last time. But it's an excellent point, And it's one that I would love to have clarified because there were different opinions uh, last time. Well, there was a challenge too, because it's meant to be per charter the first Monday of January, which is a holiday. Yep. I mean, this this year's a holiday, but 24, I mean, that's what yeah, happened it's to be last year. It's a holiday. holiday. Yeah. It's generally falling in this time frame. So are we adhering to the charter? So I think what we should do on this is bring it back as a discussion item. Hello. Bring it back as a discussion item. We can look at the charter. Separate item, yeah, because it's not, we don't have to solve it with this. This is just approving the meetings. The charter's clear, Mayor. Okay. Okay. Well, then if we want to change it, though, from what the charter says, what are the steps to do that? Yeah. Right. That's why I'm, that's what I'm asking. So when we come back, we'll, we'll do that. Right. Come back prepared with a range of options. How's that? I, to address I, everything. I just real quick. Okay. Uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't hear what Ken was saying. Um, but um, I'd like to also, if Ken, you could put together just a quick bullet point options for us from a legal perspective and also does it even need to be a special called meeting to have a swearing in? Yeah. Um, put that as an option. If you just have a swearing in ceremony, it doesn't have to be a special called meeting, just have them swear it in. And then the next time the meeting is, you're seated up there. Put that as an, I'd like to potentially entertain that one as well. And, and Joe, uh, this is Eric, so hopefully you can hear me okay. We, we'll look at all those different options. Those are all great ideas. We were just, we as staff were just trying to have it as a more convenient time for the newly elected folks because sometimes people are not in town that first day first business day of the year and i believe that was part of when it was when the city was originally set up that's why it's in the charter 
So y'all may have to make a modification, but we'll bring y'all several, several options. Of course, one option is leave it like it is, you know, right. is always an option. So we'll bring that back to y'all. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody else? So this, the, the calendar is an action item. Move to approve. Move by Joe. Second. Second by Rob. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the calendar say, wait, raise your hand. Uh, that passage unanimously. See, I remember it went at me. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is approval of mission and vision statements. Council member Lautenbacher. Thank you. I am bringing before the council the uh, Council vetted new proposed vision and mission statements. These are updates uh, to what was previously held and stays in line with our existing values as were stated earlier in cityhood. I will read the proposed mission statement, or the, sorry, vision statement first. Dunwoody fosters a thriving, vibrant, and inclusive community with exceptional neighborhoods and an innovative, responsible business environment. The proposed mission statement, Dunwoody is the choice for residents, businesses, and visitors seeking a connected community that is safe, friendly, and engaged. Through excellent services and forward-thinking planning, Dunwoody continues to enhance the quality of life for those who live, work, and visit here. Thank you. And, okay, any, we, we, we talked about it two weeks ago. We brought it back as an action item rather than consent because Joe and John were not here. Do y'all have any questions or comments or anybody else? I'm not saying you can't ask anything else, even though it might've sounded like that. <laughs> uh, as far as myself, no, I mean, you've shortened it up. You've, you've condensed it. It's, you can think of every single word to figure out what that means. I'm not sure what every single word means to me versus everybody else who reads it. So in reality, I don't know. I think it's fine. I'm good with it. I'm just, I think it's interpretive and depending on how you read it. So that's all. Uh, Joe, do you have any questions? Okay, he said no. All right, this is an action item. Move to approve. <laughs> Move by Catherine. Second. Second by Stacy. Any further discussion or comments? Seeing none, please raise your hand. Uh, that's unanimous. Next up. Oh, sorry. It's Sharon. Item number nine is to authorize contracts with not-for-profit agencies regarding direct assistance funding with the American Rescue Plan 2. Jay Vanicki. Uh, council members, I think this is the most fun you will have tonight. So we will get to the chase on this. Uh, you allocated about $2 million for direct assistance funding, and we've started a grant program that we did through a competitive process. We did a request for qualifications. And about three months ago, you approved 16 agencies and not-for-profits to be on the list. It does not guarantee funding to be on the list. Staff has worked with those, and we have nine of them tonight, when, I mean, make sure, or 10, that we recommend allocations to, and they're all before you. We met with the grant committee on these and went through the specifics on them. And to tell you some of the changes that the grant committee worked, they removed some of the ones that were just capital intensive. So this is grant operational funding. Another thing to let you know about this funding, the vast majority is direct assistance to individuals. So for instance, I'm looking at the top summit counseling, it's reduced service, reduced prices on counseling services. If it is direct assistance to an individual, it must be a Dunwoody resident. Okay. Now, in some cases, and I'll give, uh, we have a one of our dear friends in the back with I Care Atlanta. Yep, still back there. Um, <clears throat> in his case, he serves the greater community of which Dunwoody is a portion. So in some cases, we are working with organizations outside of our jurisdiction who work with our citizens. So the, the grants committee went through each and every one of these. Uh, all total, at the end of this, along with the first round that we did with summer school with Corners Outreach, this will have allotted $1.01 million, so just about half of it. And we'll get a little bit back from Corners because they didn't use all of theirs. So it's basically about half of it, and we hope to get this once approved contract signed. We They know back and forth. We've gone through iterations of it and hopefully have it out in the next couple of weeks for it. So with that, I ask any questions or a motion. Um, 
Do I know that we have our friend from I Care? Is somebody else here from a nonprofit? One of the recipients? Anybody here? Okay. Nope. Okay. Um, all right. So I wish Mr. Hickey was here in the room to hear this, which is when we I'll, I'll take him out to lunch. Right. So when I when we communicated with the nonprofits, we told them that this is once you know the, what we give them from this money is meant to be used for terminus programs or not to expect us to fund it forever and indefinite, indefinitely. So I know that we're gonna buy vans for eye care so they can provide services or this money's going to buy vans for eye care so they can provide services in a more affordable way. That's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for direct assistance. We're lo looking for direct services, but, but they all understand that when this pot of money is gone for us, it's gone from us to them, that's not, and I very seldom add to things on that, but to even the, those yeah. that are going to be in round two, yes, understand that this is that's part of the reason that they've yeah. had to wait. We want to make sure that we're evening it out throughout the city, right? So I think it's a good practice, right? So I just want to be clear for the audience that's not here. Um, all right, uh, this is good stuff. I'm very excited. Corners actually has, I mean, Summit has advertised some. I look forward to seeing what our partners come up with and how to help people. So, John, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Noticing your memo, I saw that uh, the Grants Committee review the topic of infrastructure improvement to city-owned facilities was discussed. Looks like city baseball fields, banister house, and stage door. And that funding is not really what this was intended for, right? Could you explain? We, we had a discussion about it because, and I'll give Dunwoody Senior Baseball as the, as the best one, and Jerry and them, well-meaning, they actually somewhat applied as if it was, was for the old FIT program or TIF, I forget what the acronym right. was here. And they were thinking it was more along the lines that way. Well, Brent and I sat down and kind of brainstormed a little bit. What are some things? And during the time of, and we'll give you what we kind of proposed to the grant committee. During the time of COVID, social distancing was needed in the stands at the baseball. Well, you kind of bake when you're that far out and everything during the summer. So we thought sunscreens would be something for that. In discussions with the committee, they just recommend removing the capital things. And for all of these, they were people that we work with anyway on our properties. So that was the recommendation for removal. And all of the agencies that it affected understood that. Okay, but that being said, then I start reading each of the requirements. Some say for Dunwoody residents, some do not. Um, like stage door does not mention Dunwoody at all. Um, it, says I, it says residents. Okay. And, and in the cases of those that provide, as I'm going to call it a, um, and let's, let's use stage door with that. Yeah. We've been in discussions with them. The primary focus will be for us. And, and like they, they've, um, the meaning Dunwoody residents and also the way the contract is structured, it's uh, communities disadvantaged by COVID. So they're going to have to work with us on a staff, just like we're, we're going to be their bosses on this. And when they start to do it, so for instance, if they want to, and Stage Door and I've talked about this face-to-face, -face, they wanted to take shows on the road to senior communities, okay. that's fine. And we also do understand that there are some that are on the, the, the outside of Dunwoody that still serve us. They are still our family. We received a lion's share of art funding. Again, on the edges, I'm not worried about. It's the overall... Right. documentation aspects some of these seem a little wishy-washy to me in the sense of documentation and what they're going to provide the city how are we going to audit that and what clawbacks do we have in place to take a look at it it's an excellent question it's Thank actually you. been set up to handle that what we're, what we're doing <laughs> what we're doing is we're fronting some of the grant but not all of it until they start hit, they're going to have to give us quarterly reports. Okay. The other thing we've done is, and this was a recommended grants committee. I don't have all of them done yet. So this is one of those I would have liked to have included literally the qualifications for the program for each one. So there is a con the, you have the boilerplate in there. We're still working on the scope of services, which uh, staff is prohibited from going beyond December 31st, 2023, or the dollar amount approved by council, but we can work with them on it. So for instance, Let's go with the stage door example. They can only find one senior citizen, but there are two uh, developing disabled groups that would like perform. We can work with them in that method. Quarterly reports required throughout the process and until they've proven to us that they've done good intent with the first half funding, there is no second half funding. 
again, I'm good with all of it. I just want to make sure it's done spent appropriately and wisely and that there's done as applied for. So thank you. Well, and I will say as on the grants committee, when we were talking about the qualifications, it's not a um, one size fits all, which is why they're not all done. But we felt that was very important that we want to know how they're identifying those individuals and groups. So within each individual one, they're supposed to tell us how they're doing the identification process. Yeah, and in and, and, uh, uh, work with one that the Dunwoody Nature Center and I have been going back and forth with Title I schools around here are a good barometer for it. A field trip, we'll, we'll, we'll fund it, we'll fund the buses, you know. We have lots of more Title I schools than we did. Yeah. Some of them just seem more wishy-washy to me. Some yeah. of them, I think, are more aspirational than others. That's probably a better word. So some of our partners, particularly the ones that are not in the nonprofit service delivery, but have wanted it to be, this gives them an opportunity, but they don't have the program developed yet. And I can even give you a, a prime example. Right. Dunwoody Preservation Trust and I are still trying to come up with a program right. for them. That's why they're not on right. the list yet. Right. Okay. Um, all right. This is a business move, move, move by John. Question. I've, I've oh, comment. wait. Joe had a question. I forgot he was there. That's all right. Um, yeah. Oh, but Joe has a question too. Oh. Sorry. Okay, yeah, the program management of this, Jay, um, I've got two questions. So I know our, our other fundings, major funding, we're allocating to have, who's managing all this? Is it current staff? Or are we outsourcing the management of all this oversight? This is one that Linda, Richard, and I are managing it together. And it is the way we've got it set up works. It makes it a little bit slower, but I think we've probably streamlined the process as, as excellent as a city this size could. I'm just, you know, obviously I'm just concerned if you guys have too much on your plate um, to be focused and have that, be able to be efficient on that. Um, so don't hesitate, obviously, if you need oversight on that for a, a you know, a, an independent ha hand there. Um, and then the feedback, the reporting, John brought it up as well. It's in the contract, Stacy did. Um, what does that look like? So the the feedback loop of saying, yeah, okay, we're we're halfway through this, and here's what we've delivered. Um, what does that generally look like, or going to look like, Jay? What do you think? For each one, it'll differ contract to contract um, on the quarterly report. And let me just pick on Summit Healthcare because that's one that we've gone we've gone in pretty good details because their records are good. But I, as a city staffer, don't want their records because there are identifiers on them. So in their cases, they're going to give a reduced rate for counseling for this person or a free rate to this person. They can give me identifiers which strip the identity of the person. In other words, the name, street address, or apartment number would be moved, show that, and then they would have to uh, do some form of affidavit to say this was a resident of Dunwoody at this time. There will have to be some working with them on their documentation, but that's part of the, we don't give them the whole grant at once. We want them to show that they're making steps. And at the end, there are provisions where if there are, if they cannot prove that the money was spent, then we can require it to come back. I don't think it will get to that point with any of these agencies. Okay, thanks. No further questions. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Rob, I'm sorry. I was just going to make a quick observation and a clarification. We stripped a lot of the capital funding out of this. Um, we did in some cases keep it. And the logic for keeping that was that it was capital improvements that were necessary to deliver services, which Excellent. is why I care Atlanta, for example, has equipment to store food. Um, and, you know, stage door has an art closet for supplies for, um, you know, needy, um, you know, artists and art patrons. So I'm just, that's, just a, very, that's a very good, and that was the exact words that were used during it. Um, I have a question just really quick about Summit, particularly, and it's really in the weeds, but when we're talking about our name, so if Summit's in the schools, they could be serving kids from Doraville too, but that's, going to you 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 have nuances right here and here's the and again this is all new uncharted territory right. for Dunwoody so we're kind of putting right. feelers out there and here's here's the the current model right if it is a citizen Dunwoody a resident right that's okay if it is a student in a school in Dunwoody even though they may live in a jurisdiction right. that is okay. okay that's fine all right John had made a motion and then we fit uh second uh, moved by John, second by Tom. All in favor, raise your hand. Uh, that passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Mr. Walker. Sorry. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jay, because I know it's a lot of work. Um, Sharon may not be ready yet. So. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. The next item is the park master plans for 5435 Roberts Drive and 48 and 4819 Vermack Road, Brent Walker. Thank you, Sharon. Let me share this real quick. All right. So this evening we're bringing back the uh, parts master plans for Roberts Drive and Burmack Road. And also there's a small um, contract amendment I need to make to uh, Pond's contract to finish these plans up. There was an additional $6,300 we'll need uh, towards uh, that contract to wrap it up um, just with the additional iterations and some additional work they've had to do on the site. Uh, we crossed over what we had allocated for the project. So we'll need to amend that contract to that amount. Um, but Matt Water is here from Pond. He's going to go through the presentation like he did at the September meeting uh, and answer a lot of the questions that you guys had based on the uh, previous um, um, draft plans. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Matt, and then we'll be here to answer any other questions that y'all might have before y'all potentially vote. Good evening. So we were here last time to talk about sort of the progress schedule updates, some cost opinions and next steps. So that's what we're doing yet once again. I uh, was here a month ago, September. So just jump right to it. Uh, the big things that came up last month, we're looking at a few options, A, B, and C, of uh, kind of configurations of the ball fields, soccer field, uh, multi-use field, and, and the Roberts Drive. And at Vermac, we uh, did one little utility cost update. So jump into those. Vermac, uh, there's the master plan. Nothing changed on that from last month. The summary of design change really was physically with nothing visible, but the, the change was really updated cost. Utility costs include upgrading the city uh, of Dunwoody Park's office to sewer from septic. So um, that is what is in here. We did also talk significantly, I guess, last time about um, being very inclusive of all ages and all uh, abilities in the playgrounds. So definitely included that. There's a few more images in the slide deck and then the final documents have a uh, reference to uh, the inclusivity across the playgrounds. Um, really no changes to Vermac with regard to parking. We talked about this last time. So again, uh, sufficient parking, but also um, put a depressed or a reduced rate on it to account for people that will walk and bike to the park. Uh, so the current standing forecasted project in today's dollars is just over 4.3 million for Vermac. Let's see if I can get it to fit on the screen right there. So. And you see some of the big breakdown points across there, but 4.3 is where we're standing right now. A couple of the itemized items that were in here. One question that came up last uh, month when I was here was regarding the, the solar canopies that were over some of the parking areas. Uh, we have done some of these in other sort of similar sized parks. Really, until you have designed and dedicated and know all the loads, you don't really know how big the solar panel needs to be. So you got to get into some of that more design and engineering. But the reality is probably somewhere in the realm of about a 2,000 square foot panel or a solar array. Uh, and depending, you know, foot footage doesn't, square footage doesn't always correlate to how many kilowatt hours that that panel will create. There are different types of panels. Uh, but at any rate, you probably spend about half a million dollars on something like that upfront, uh, which would be a reasonable size to provide either power directly to the park or power that you would sell back. Uh, and that cost could offset your cost to provide power in the park. There's different options to go about it. Uh, the reality is probably the payback period on that is somewhere in the eight to 10 year range. They put $500,000 up front now. Eight to 10 years, it pays itself back. And going on beyond that, you continue to reap the benefits of it. So, um, Roberts uh, Park, we had a lot more conversation about that one last time, um, really focused around this field. So, 
what you're seeing is what you saw last time, basically a 300 by 150 foot field, uh, what you can see there in the black outline. We actually dropped on some soccer white lines so you can at least get a sense of what that looks like instead of just being a big green square rectangle. Um, we jump to the next page. <clears throat> we widen the field from the 150 to the 165. That's indicated in the yellow down below. Uh, I can't kind of flip back and forth, so I can only glide back and forth. But you can see, if you look at the basketball courts up here, we went from a full court and two halves in option A, which we saw last month, to a full court and a single half court, added some little bit of reconfiguration. And if you were able to jump between images, you would see that some of the tennis courts and pickleball and things to the to the south there kind of jumped down the screen a little bit to accommodate this. Uh, then option C was what if we really maximized and lengthened the field too to get to that 330 foot length that was uh, to be considered. Um, that also leaves us with the a full court and a half court basketball kind of pushes things around a little bit uh, and it impacts some of the needs for retaining wall um, to the from your screen looking to the left side of the field uh, off to, to the left of that extension to get to the field to the 330 foot distance. So there are three slides here, option A, B, and C of the master plans. It's You're not gonna be able to see a lot of difference unless you're gonna click, click, click back and forth between the three and you can see stuff move around slightly. But each one of these represents uh, a final plan with option A, B, or C uh, included in it. Um, I will note, I'm just gonna say, we got an error on this slide. Somehow it went down in parking spaces from last month. That is not correct. If you actually look on the plans, there are a hundred and I think five spaces I counted, or 104 spaces I counted on the plan. So we'll update that, but do know there is there is the correct amount of parking in the, uh, in the plan. Looking at the cost opinions. So here is A, B, and C side by side thinking about how the recon reconfigurations of the fields uh, affect things. Um, we highlighted in yellow the items that really jumped by $100,000 or more, as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars. So just pointing across the line there, you can see the changes between options A, B, and C that impacts the hardscape and furnishings line item, um, some of the program elements, uh, construction total, you can see where it moves. So it's really, it's a matter of, um, pavements and basketball courts and shifting some things around on site that are impacted by the cost. So it doesn't, it doesn't fluctuate a ton. And this is probably all within a margin of error of what you'll see by the time you actually go out to bid for construction. So it's, um, it, nothing went uh, way off the reservation. You see, we went up a few hundred thousand dollars from A to C and it dropped a few hundred thousand dollars from A to B. Um, and all that is to be, you know, finalized and caught up in contingencies and final design engineering when we get to that point. Um, it was really, you know, the multi-purpose field. Um, when you look at some of the individual program elements, the field picked up some, you know, additional cost in these single line items here as well. Uh, and that really should answer all of the questions from last time, I believe. If not, I can actually sit here and help clarify anything that you may still have questions about or anything new that's come up since we talked about it last month. Okay. Um, Joe, do you have any questions or comments? Wait, 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 stop. So one of the things you need us to decide tonight is A, B, or C on Vermac. Roberts, Roberts okay. Yeah, you knew what I meant. Um, a, B, a, B, or C on Roberts. That's one of the things we need to finalize. Or what, what, if we're going to finish this tonight, we need to finalize it. Okay. Just pick one. Yeah. Okay. So before we get to that, or maybe while you're talking, Joe, if you have any questions, opinions, or if you want to not say anything, that's fine. I can hold off on the options. And okay. then just, I've just got a generic couple of comments for Roberts. All right, I'll speak up. So yeah, I, I like Vermac. Um, I think pedestrian connectivity to Vermac to the adjoining neighborhoods uh, should be included. We can have a further conversation when we talk about Vermac specifically. Um, and then on the Roberts Drive, I was asking to get a the walking path 
the whole circumference so that you could go around a whole circle. So I know Brent, you said you were going to chat with Michael Smith about how you can get up to Roberts Drive, uh, the adjoining ends of those two, um, at minimum connect to the sidewalk, or can we double wide the sidewalk? Um, any any thought about that, uh, Brent, of connecting the whole two links so you can go around a nice loop circle for a yeah, jogging so path? If you look, this is option C, but all of them have some iteration of this. So you have this dash line, which is a trail that goes up through the property, and then it connects to this hardscape sidewalk that does go through all the amenities and connects back to this path here. So there is a a, a path or sidewalk that circumnavigates the entire site. And then, of course, when we get into construction documents, we'll formalize those connections through the parking lots onto the sidewalk that runs to Roberts. There's also some potential opportunity to grab uh, the sidewalk right here and bring it up through a, a natural path into this wooded area. So a lot of that will be details that can be fleshed out when we get into construction documents of the site. At the master plan level, though, we are showing kind of a a circular pathway that does connect throughout the site and the amenities throughout. Yeah, I I appreciate the conversation of going, the continuation of getting back up to Roberts on both the links, because otherwise you're going in between, there's a lot of pedestrians, a lot of traffic activity, whatever, a lot of, lot of interactions on there. Just the idea of a nice circular loop. It's all I'm just trying to get at. Um, so if you have that point number four at the top, just, hook back over toward Roberts instead of going through the basketball courts and down by 17. You're right there, actually. 17 is getting to the sidewalk, it looks like. So if you can get four over the sidewalk, and then we can talk to Michael Smith, say, hey, can we like widen the sidewalk in that segment or do something on that? Um, I, I'd love to see that. So, yeah. And that that's that's something we've actually looked at on the current site. Uh, we've We've kind of created some pathways in that wooded area. And there is a location in there that we're looking at adding a connection to the sidewalk now. Uh, so when we go to build the park, it would be an, an obvious thing to continue to have as part of the final plan set. Right. Um, and the last question, and I don't want to change the scope or anything, is all the three options. They have the same amount of parking spaces. That's roughly uh, 100 spaces, correct? Um, yes. Brent, that's right. Right. And how have we measured that? I know at Vermac we said, you know, they're gonna we're trying to get it more of a neighborhood focus and people can walk or bike there. Um, how was that metric backed in for that calculation for parking usage? Oh, it's further down. So what uh Pond did is they they did parking comparisons for each amenity and then backed it out by percentage to reduce it for walkability, 30% for walking bike. Now this number is inaccurate. I believe um, you know, the total, uh, it actually, it equals after the percentage is 100. So the actual total will be well above 111, 130-ish roughly, and then we're back down to 100. So they're accounting for 30% uh, parking spot reduction based on pedestrian access to the park. And and is this to assume that it's fully activated uh, so we have every field being used fully for accommodation for that parking at one time? So the way it works, because several of the amenities within the park are um, passive self-guiding, guided use amenities like the playground, the splash pad, things like that. So through programming, we'll have to see what's the best use of the parking space we have. Uh, we'll program the fields, we will set those schedules so we'll know when the um, parking lot needs to be used for the splash pad and when it needs to be used for the uh, multi-use fields. So through programming, we'll have to determine um, what what times to plan those activities. And certainly, you know, the splash pad is seasonal. So during the splash pad seasons of the year, we'll have to take that into account for how we schedule that multi-use field. Um, with parks, uh, and you even see that Brook Run, as many parking spaces as it has, it, it's hard to know exactly what you're going to need based on the activities you have here. All you can do is your best planning and hope that there's adequate parking for all the activities that are going on at one time. But we will control that flow based on the um, programming opportunities we put we put into the fields and, and to the active spaces over there. 
Right. I mean, in my heart, obviously, I would, I don't want to see, obviously, you can have people that are looking, if it gets full, then they're going to go down the neighborhood streets. Are they going to be parking in front of people's homes over there and they're joining neighborhoods? And do we need to, will we need to eventually designate that for parking for residents only? Um, you know, that's one side of the spectrum. And the other side of the spectrum is, hey, if we don't need 100 car spaces, then we could have more green space. You know, that that's just at the end of the day. Um, but um, anyway, that was all those are all my kind of questions, but I'd love to have that nice loop, uh, jogging loop. That's that's my two cents. Thank you. OK, um, Tom, do you have anything on these? Oh, well, the fields, I guess. Um, yeah, and no, I'll just I'll just comment. So I'll start with Roberts. Um, Thank you for giving us the options there. Um, for me, option B is would be my preference. Um, and just, just as a reminder, the additional space, the additional width in the field gives us a lot more options. It a lot, number one, it makes it a high school official width for, for soccer matches. Um, and also it allows for cutting the field in half for two youth fields, which we wouldn't have had with the narrow width. So uh, it gives us more options and more, uh, functionality and at a lower cost. So to me, that's win, win, win. I mean, we lose one half basketball court, but quite honestly, I kind of like the layout a little better, which is the one full court and a half court. I think it, 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 it fits in better and, and looks nicer. So um, for me, option B is, is, is good. Um, for, for Vermac, um, I'll, I'll echo uh, one of the comments that um that Joe made regarding the connection to the neighborhood. I, th I do think that's fine. And Brent, did you, do you have, I know, yeah. I know uh, Stacy had talked with you I earlier. A, I have a markup. Um, Bond has to pay me for this. One. Maybe for efficiency, we should talk about Roberts and then Vermac. It's, uh, it's up to y'all. That, that's fine with me if you want to do it that way. Yeah. Maybe just, that might so be, then that, you don't have to zoom back and, back forth. and forth. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that's all I have on Roberts. My, Roberts. my preference would be option B. Okay. Roberts. We'll do Roberts first. All right. Rob. Yeah. This is easy because I only have one comment on. Well, I, I, I have two comments on Roberts. One, you I, only got one. Uh, okay, that's fine. You got, is there something you need to know? Okay. Um, I, I do like one of the options that has uh, the expanded field uh, just for, for better use. Uh, I'm fine with option B since that's the lower cost option. Um, circling back to, um, to Vermac, only to introduce this topic for Roberts, um, we're looking at solar at Vermac. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if at some point we wanted to do something similar at Roberts, is there a cost differential between putting in infrastructure now for that? Just I'm thinking in terms of like conduit and, and wiring um, versus retrofitting later. And what might that difference in cost be? It's always cheaper to put empty conduit in at construction. We do that on occasion um, for security cameras. If we don't know where they're gonna go, we'll stub out and have a pool box outside the building footprint just if we need to run future utilities. It's very low cost at the time of construction. It gets more expensive when you get in to post-construction and it's operating because you either have to mount on the exterior of the building, which doesn't look great, or you have to bore and drill into the, um, the foundation. So I always typically put in extra conduit just because it's inexpensive and you never know what you're gonna have to run somewhere back to the panel. So uh, that's a practice that we do already in construction. So we would do it. At that's good. I, I would be in favor in that, of that. I, I Philosophically, I, I think it would be nice for the city to push towards being um, carbon neutral on its uh, energy use. And uh, you know, solar panels obviously have, once they're paid off, they start to generate. So anything that we can plan for that might reduce future operating costs, I think is a win-win for the city. Sure. Yeah, and there's gonna be continuing innovation and things that come with that over the years too that may make it more profitable. Uh, Catherine. I think if we look at use of, I mean, people actually standing in place, the basketball courts would be way more used in the field. And while I would love to have more and keep the four original, I appreciate the need for flexibility for a wider field. So I too am in favor of option B. Is that your only feedback? Okay. Stacey. Um, I actually spent some time talking to a um, U.S. lacrosse representative today to find out how it feels because I think, well, 
thank you for putting the soccer lines on so we can kind of get a, you know, this is a multi-use field. And I think we all need to keep that in mind. Um, the 130 by 165 is approximately the same size as what is just up the road at Dunwoody Springs, where they hold youth and adult league lacrosse games. So it does give us a lot more flexibility. I'm with Catherine. I would love to have it all, but um, I like the layout of option B better. Um, and I think it, uh, I think it would be great asset in our city. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, Brent, I guess I had a number of comments from citizens in the last couple of days. Some of them seeing the soccer layout and they were not overly happy with it. So as um, Stacy just mentioned, it's multi-use and we're not planning on having soccer lines put out, are we? Correct. I think what we're envisioning for this field is to have tick marks solely so okay. that it there wouldn't be a primary sport but it could be have an overlay of a lacrosse or soccer or practice facilities for other types of sports. But it's uh, not artificial turf. It's just grass, right? No, this is artificial. This is artificial it's turf. Artificial. Okay. I just want, I'm trying to understand. Yeah. And that, so that allows us to determine how we want to program it. And the idea behind this field was to, to keep it more as a in-house scheduling from the parks department, mm -hmm. not necessarily allocated to a athletic association, like our baseball fields and our current soccer fields so that we would have more um, programming flexibility and, and have an opportunity to kind of establish new, new types of sports activities. So we're not just relying on the existing sports programs we have, but trying to be innovative in our programming and have a type of facility we could do that in. All right, so as far as the vetting of this project, these projects, what have we done in the sense of, I mean, I remembered an open house and we had a whole bunch of things there, but we've had the girls softball idea that got changed and morphed. We had a little bit of things. Tell, there was nobody here commenting on any of this. I had a whole bunch of emails. Where are we in the sense of the public relations and the public feedback on these ideas? Have we really gotten much feedback? I don't know. Not That's, much. I mean, the, the changed. The biggest concern we heard from the neighbors were program sports and traffic and the type of program we have at Brookrine with athletic associations and things like that. So the thought was that with this type of facility, we would have all the passive amenities of self-guided programming that you could have in a neighborhood park, but we also have an opportunity to have some active recreation here because we're in dire need of that also in the city but it wouldn't be at the scale of what you see at Brook Run. There wouldn't be that ebb and flow of cars coming in and out between games. Um, this could be utilized for, for adult practices or it could be utilized for younger kids' games that don't draw that massive crowd that you see at some of our other sporting uh, facilities. So uh, it was trying to strike a balance between the need we have for active spaces without the traffic problem that comes with it but also providing some of those self-guided amenities that are desirable, especially in the north side of town where we don't have them. You know, we don't have basketball courts and things like that. So it's it's straddling that line uh, of what, and it was what we heard. Uh, there was a large contingency of people that wanted active programming, and there was a lot of, large contingency of people that didn't. Right. So we've tried to strike that balance with this. Design. And I think you've done a wonderful job striking that balance. That being said, I'm just concerned about the, residents and the families that at one point may have seen softball or may have you know thoughts of where's our football field or where's this or where's that and i'm not sure we've had big discussions again i haven't had a whole lot besides the last couple of days when some football guys said you're putting in another soccer field where's mine the idea of peachtree middle school um, the football field there we have a 25 year probably now only 20 year lease and after hours on that football field to use and maintain, we put up the lights, a couple hundred thousand dollars. We put up the structure, and right now we're not maintaining that. That project has sort of been in limbo, right? I mean, it hasn't been funded, and we haven't talked to the school system about having a use of that or returfing that for artificial turf for that project, even though we have some 20 year rights to do so. Is that where we're at on that? Correct. Yes. Okay. We we would have to re-examine the IGA we have with the cab and restructure that with the Board of Education to, to be able to put that turf in. Um, we're currently, you know, 
the goal of this is to get the master plans for these two park properties. Right. I understand. So that's that. a separate, that's a larger conversation to have about athletic facilities as a whole in the city. It certainly ties into the design of this park. Um, but it it's a it's an asset and it's a possibility. And we need to have those conversations. It okay. just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, that asset, by the way, that capital possible project is not on the list, Tom, for your committee, the citizen committee. It's not on that committee's discussion. So I'd love for you to take a look at that. To see speaking about Peachtree? Yeah, the yeah. Peachtree Middle School Field. It's not on your list. I looked at the documents that were published on the agenda and I didn't see it. And that's just a recent revelation to me. Um, again, I'm okay with the plans for the uh, B. I mean, if it's not that much money right now, we have zero money for any development of these parks. These are pie in the sky plans with not a dollar in our pocket to fund it. So going forward, you know, if this is what's best, this is our ideas now. If we don't find funding in the short term, there'll probably be another council who's going to look at this plan when they fund it. That being said, I do like what's here. It's artificial turf. Great. It's got basketball. It's got pickleball. It's got everything. A whole lot of needs. We've already talked about the parking um, size. Somebody was questioning that. Um, if I'm holding my comments on Vermac, I, I will hold Vermac, but that's where I am on this. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Anybody have other comments? Or maybe I forgot you. Sorry. Um, with that, like after if no more discussion, I move to approve and we go with um, option B for the plan for Robert. Can we separate these because of the way the agenda is put? Okay. okay. All right. So I'm, first I'm going to ask the council women who happen to represent district one, if they think this has been public, this process has been public enough. Okay. Because we had lots of feedback. We removed the active softball snack. There is, do we leave a snack bar? Because I had not, I'm really not a fan of a snack bar, but go ahead. Well, I, I believe it's been published enough. It's been out there. It's been in the public. This is the second meeting. It's been in the paper. I feel very strongly that just, it's- I was just yeah. asking. Yep, I do, I do. I was just curious. I kind of, so I didn't hear from anybody except for a very angry text that we hate football. For the record, I really like football. Um, I think the striping it for the picture for one sport was probably not the wisest decision. Um, I am concerned about two things. One is that you, one is future use of this facility and also not really related to this conversation, but how now, even though I had really asked that we not have one athletic association controlling the fields at Brook Run, it sounds like we might. And I think council really needs to talk about that, Eric. I think it really needs to be a discussion. If that's how you feel it is, I don't think that I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for everybody, but I thought we talked about trying to avoid a Dunwoody seniors situation at Brook Run. And it sounds like maybe we've backed into one. And so maybe not, but I'm you said it, aware. you said it. I'm quote, you just said it unless I misunderstood oh, no, no, you. Yeah, that, that is not what I meant at okay. all. That is not what I meant at all. Okay, because we have, we have lots of user groups. Using okay, well, fields. you said, what you said was, is this is going to be different from Brook Run and the baseball fields because there's not going to be one athletic association controlling it. That's how I heard it. I apologize. Okay. That is not how that Okay, was which surprised me because I thought there were lots of groups there using Brook Run. So... With this, right, so with this, I think that we have to be conscientious about how we use it, because it doesn't matter whether it's a youth soccer game or an adult football practice or lacrosse, if they're closely scheduled, you're going to get that traffic, because people come early, they leave late, they run into their friends, so when you schedule it, and John tells me that the field at Peachtree is like scheduled for six straight hours a day. It's used a lot. And so if we're if we're if we we said to the neighbors, we heard your concerns about traffic, then we owe it from a programming perspective to program it appropriately, just like we had to make the baseball people do in the summer of 2020. You can't have things back to back if you don't want tons of people gathering. So I'll just add that because that's that. I'm okay with the, I have no strong preference over field size or 
uh, I was stopped at in the village the other night about pickleball and how desperately people want pickleball. Uh, we've got it. I would still argue that maybe we can do a little deep dive and see if tennis, you know, whatever. With should we have fewer tennis courts in that part of town and more pickleball? I don't know. But anyway, okay. So we're on to Vermac. Did you get everything you needed from council? I think everybody was okay with B. Is that correct? And um, you'll look at the paths and the sidewalk connectivity and the neighborhood connectivity um, with that. Yeah. And okay. Just to, to make sure with Joe's comment, you know, at a master plan level, there's still a lot of things yes. to be dialed into at Absolutely. the construction document. He's stage. nodding so his head. Yeah. Those things will be fleshed out then. Right. Okay. Um, the next one is Vermac. If you could go back to that, please. Nope. All right. And now, Tom, you can go with your Vermac comments. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my only comment on Vermac would be, um, and got my second already brought this up, was a connection, a path connecting to the to the neighborhood. And I believe you have a rendering that might show that. Yeah, let me see if I can grab. Let's see if it's on there. Tab keeps dropping. <laughs> Go away. All right. Can you guys see mm -hmm. the change? Yeah, I, I think that's critical. Um, I, at one point, and I don't remember the exact numbers, and I didn't have the time to to redo my my map and compass thing, but I, I dropped a pin there at that location where the two neighborhoods connect and drew a quarter mile circle. And I think there was something like 52 houses within that quarter mile. So quarter mile is extremely reasonable walk to access something uh, that, that opens up walking access to that park for a, a lot of residents. Um, I think we'd be doing an extreme disservice, especially for a city that is trying to promote itself as pedestrian friendly to not have that connection there. Um, otherwise, not only is it make easier access, but that village mill section in particular has to drive a long way to actually get out yes. to the park. So uh, to me, I think that's a critical component. And for complete transparency, I want to make sure that it's on the plan that we approve and that it's not something that we add in later so that the residents know that is our intent to do that. So that would be my only comment on Vermac. But otherwise, um, otherwise, good job. Rob. All right, I'm, I'm going to circle back to solar, um, just sure. because uh, this was actually a topic I have gotten some citizen feedback and right. emails about. Right. Um, and I guess the first question, and, and you kind of touched on it and said you would have to wait to see the final design, but how do you go about determining how much, for, the, for this solar project here, did we base it on just what's a reasonable size for pilot? Did we base it on, hey, did we think this size would probably power the park? I guess how do how do how was the size of the proposed? As I mentioned, we've done a couple of similar parks in the past, um, and they have one in particular was size to power the lights and a splash pad and the restrooms, but it really wasn't powering them. It was generating enough power that they sold it back to Georgia Power at a certain price, and then bought energy at a discount so it was a net neutral cost that that was my second question yeah. is what is the more likely use is it to use some and sell some is it just to sell it back and use it as a credit i mean to there's the bill? difference of, of infrastructure of how you do it right you either have to install the system so that it pushes power to the grid or you install the system that has the batteries to store the power yeah. on site so that you can use it when you need it on demand so it's it's a matter of sitting down with the solar you know engineers and, and guys at the time to say all right this is the master plan we would like to power this many pole lights which we haven't figured out yet this many you know do we want to include any electric car charging stations yeah. uh, there's this much load from facilities and whatnot so they, they got to go through a number of engineering calculations and then you can weigh the options as to what those are so that would come in the next phase okay. so it's a matter of Keep it in now, knowing you can yeah, work through yeah. that. Yeah, I, I, def I definitely like keeping it in now, but yeah, certainly battery cost versus, a, you know, probably a smaller, you know, Georgia Power is going to keep their margins, so they're going to give us less than. Well, and that's it too. Okay. you got to see how, if you look over the 
uh, even just the past decade or so, how they've operated, there's been changes in how power companies okay. collaborate with or against people putting solar on their houses. Now, Georgia Power or others want to tax people who put stuff on their house because they're not buying their guaranteed rate from the guarantee, you know, the power company. So it's the game you play. So sticking with the, the financial side of that, um, just ballpark costs, you know, we're building a canopy to put these panels on. If they were just to be constructed, I don't know that you could do it feasibly, but on top of the, the park building there, the restrooms there, or on, you know, standalone in a field, which would be a horrible use of that field. But what's the, uh, what's the cost differential between installing on existing structures or not having to build a canopy versus using a canopy? You know, it depends on the structure. You may have to up the uh, structural integrity of that facility for wind loads and everything else because of the panels, mm -hmm. depending on the orientation of the structure. Is it orientated to get the maximum, you know, sun angles on the panels? There's a lot of things that go into consideration with it. You know, the nice thing is if it's parking, it actually provides some shade mm -hmm. for the cars that are parked underneath it. Uh, there have been, you know, many places. I grew up in Cincinnati. They've done it. The zoo parking lot is full yeah. of, of canopies. I, I have it's, seen at Fort Irwin, the, the, they built a new hospital there about 10 years ago, and the entire parking lot is solar panels. Yeah. Covered, and in the desert, obviously, covered parking is useful. I, I like this idea. I like the idea of, um, you know, reducing energy input and, you know, eventually getting a, a return to reduce operating costs on this. And I like the idea of double using impervious space. Uh, I just had some questions on that. Um, uh, the other comment, there's been some discussion about a potential trail down to Village Mill and the other neighborhood there. Um, I have actually, the, the comment came earlier about what kind of citizen input we've gotten. I actually shared um, the Village Mill plan with a group that I met with from uh, the Village Mill neighborhood um, earlier in the month. At that time, the design did not show a path down to there. So I told them that, but I did mention that I thought that was something that was likely to happen um, in the future, that there was likely to be the kids in the neighborhood just cutting through and the city would have to take care of it. I do like the idea of marking something. I think we should indicate, you know, potential you know, future connection or somehow indicate that we haven't quite figured out what that might be yet, but that something is, is you know, possibly going to occur there in the future. Um, and I think that's all the notes I have on Vermac for now. Thank you. Kathy. I too am a big fan of solar. That is my favorite part of this park. Um, I could say from the residential side, it is, I wouldn't make it a cost analysis in terms of getting your money back because that is likely not going to happen. So I would do it anyway. I think covered parking, shaded parking is great. I think showing an investment in solar is great. I wish it were over every parking spot and at Roberts. That would be ideal. Um, and again, on the residential side, once you hit a threshold with Georgia Power, you're not selling this back for money. You can give it back. They'll take it back, but you're not going to get paid. So the economic prospect for this just it gets lower every minute. So that's not the way to look at it, but I love the idea and I'd love to see more. Thank you. Joe, do you have anything? I know you talked about the path already. Yeah. Um, no, I... I get, I think, you know, talk about sustainability features and so on. We, we talk the talk, walk the walk, right? We've had a sustainability committee commission for years. Myself, Stacy, Tom have been on there. And I, I would, I'd like to see that. Um, I always look for an issue. And then I say, is what's systemic that we can build upon this? So out of the, you know, we're going off kind of one off doing this solar thing. Um, I'd like to see potentially, we talk about it at our retreat. Um, really sitting down and looking at our master sustainability plan for the city and saying, okay, well, by default, when we build new things or do things, let's have this checklist of sustainability. So it would be one of those things. So I, I'd like to see that. And, and like when we get in the construction phase of these things uh, with Brent, let's see what other kind of features we're going for there um, as well. So whether it's net, you know, goal is net zero carbon emission by year X, whatever like that is. So, um, and I, I do just like this park in general because it really is a, a, a neighborhood park. Tom alluded to uh, all those houses within a quarter mile walkable connectivity to neighborhoods. It really is a neighborhood park. And so by having that walkway to the neighborhoods, the neighbor is gonna 
access it. It makes sense. And I really support it and doing it and having full disclosure on there. Um, I like the more passive on the, on the, um, which way Northeast, where like number six, the pavilion, uh, ADA sensory, you know, have that more passive because those are backyards, people's homes. So have that more passive and quiet and have the more active toward the front. So um, I just, I really like the park design. And as I talked about that interpretive signage on uh, the loop of 16 of working with the Dunwoody Preservation Trust to talk about um, what was in the area before the Europeans settled here. Uh, for historical education and tie in with, with Don Woody Preservation Trust. So anyway, um, thank you all for this. Stacey. A um, couple things. Um, I also think it's important that we place make that connectivity to the neighborhoods. And also as the, as the PATH Foundation is doing their work, I think they would look at us and think we were crazy if we didn't try and do something there. So I would look to them like as they're doing the information gathering and, and what all we have, I think I would look to their guidance as to what that could possibly be in the future. Brent, you and I have had a conversation. I know you alluded to it last time because we were very much like, we want this to be an inclusive, you know, a playground and remind me like there's a person on staff and how you would go about deciding what this playground is actually going to look like. Sure. So playgrounds have evolved in a lot over the past 20 years. And one of the big um, communities that they look at, specifically a lot of the, the vendors, the manufacturers of playgrounds, they look at special needs communities. Um, one, because the need has never been honestly taken care of like it should have been. And now there is a kind of a groundswell of, of families that need that type of service. So for instance, uh, there's a manufacturer that we've used uh, at uh, Winwood Hollow and also uh, at Two Bridges Park that it, it manufactured the playground for us, uh, landscape structures. Uh, they have staff people uh, that this is their main focus. They actually go out and do trainings on how to design and build uh, therapeutic playgrounds. Um, so what I would suggest, and the mayor came to my office the other day and we talked about it, uh, and it's actually her suggestion is when we get into uh, determining what the playground designer or developer is, is that we do some community outreach uh, to that community and have a design charrette, um, find out what the needs are, what we need to be focusing on for either you know, sensory play equipment, um, uh, approachability uh, access to playground elements. Like what are all the things that check all the boxes for when we do the design? So almost master planning that component of the park when we go right before we do construction documents. So when we go uh, to put the, the bid out, we say, these are the elements that playground has to have. And it's developed from that community here in Dunwoody. John. Uh, thank you. I have two issues when it comes to this park. Let me, um, first I had a bunch of feedback regarding solar and I know very little about solar mm -hmm. and I'm hearing rates and sale and all the rest. I think it's a good thing. I just not sure on how to do it. So I, I have more questions and answers and I don't really know, but if it's the right thing to do, let's do it. That being said, the questions that were raised to me by a resident was, well, why are you doing it there? Why isn't it on city hall where you can have an emergency backup here in this building? Why aren't you doing it not there now, you know, perfect it there. Why is it going out to a park and you're going to have to sell it and do this and do that? Why there and why not here? So that was something that was raised. And if it's the right thing to do, why are we doing it with bond with parks money and possibly bond money to do this? Is it more of a general fund type issue when it comes to funding? Is the is the parks funding the right mechanism to install it? Somebody raised that. I don't have the answers for it and I don't need an answer. But again, I have more questions on solar than I have answers. It sounds like it's the right thing to do and I'm okay to approve what's there. But that being said, I wish I knew more. I wish I knew more, I, I guess. Um, all right. Second point. Um, several hours ago, we, myself included, removed the word that we were going to be a transparent council to out of our mission. And we're, um, I guess I could pull it back up, that we're doing other stuff. We're going to be forward thinking instead. And that's good, but I'm still going to be transparent. When we publish documents and we're having a conversation tonight regarding these various parks and making changes, 
and I'm not sure of the transparency in the sense of the public information that we've shared. I know I've had conversations with residents backing up to Vermac Park regarding this path. That path, it was not in any document tonight whatsoever. I know that people are gonna go ballistic when they find out that we're, at least four of us, are on this, are gonna add that back into this plan when it wasn't advertised as such. That being said, I would hope that we defer this matter tonight, that we re-advertise or re-plan out and finalize plan B, that it's no, not a soccer field, that show me how the ticks work, show me how it's able to be used for lacrosse Absolutely. and other sports as well, that's a multi-use field. Show me the Vermac on what you're thinking of doing there. Show me the path, show me show me what we are really thinking of approving tonight and tell the residents, have some type of public information, push it out, give them time for feedback. Because if we now push out and change and approve this tonight with that path in there, I think we're being, we're doing a disservice to the community because there's a number of residents that have reviewed this tonight, don't see it and are counting on us not to add it tonight. So from that perspective, um, if we were to vote on this tonight, I'm gonna to vote against it. I'm hoping that we defer it because I think we need to publicize this a little bit wider, improve some of the photos, explain exactly what we're doing and you know how we should move forward. That's my point, thank you. Okay, so I wanna share my thoughts if that's okay. So I actually believe that we took all the feedback that we got about the Austin Park, and we made changes that met their needs. We are doing exactly the opposite on the feedback we got from Vermac. And it and to be clear, I went and met with them. And I'm not saying that any individual citizen or citizens get to veto a citywide project. I felt that way about Roberts. I feel that way about this. But if I asked, so, you know, you talked about your radius, right? But I heard from people in that radius that weren't the impacted neighbors that didn't want us to do it either, which again, I'm not saying they get veto power. What I'm saying is, is I agree with John. This wasn't published in the agenda. It what There's no transparency. They think this is, we haven't had it in a picture in a while. They think we put this to rest. If anything, I would be okay splitting them, but if it's cleaner to put them both out there, However, but I'm I'm not going to vote for this Vermac plan. I'm just not because I feel like we did exactly what you know we worked really hard to satisfy the Austin the neighbors of the old Austin Park or whatever we're calling it Roberts Drive, which will have a different name. Um, and yet on Vermac, we're doing exactly the opposite of what the neighbors that were paying attention ask us to do, with no opportunity to feedback. And so we could end up there anyway, and that's okay. But I think we have to tell them. I don't think, we, or we have to publicize it and see if anybody's you know, paying attention, but we have to give them. And I would charge the council people that represent district two to lead that conversation. I mean, I let it, you know, I met with them before because I was just a council person. No, I guess I was mayor already. But, but my point is on that particular issue, in my opinion, it's not fair. It's not right to vote on this tonight because they haven't seen it. It hasn't been vetted. It hasn't, it just to John's point, I, I disagree a little about it. Austin, I think we met those communities demands and I think we could vote on that tonight if it's easier. Um, and then I don't understand enough about solar to say that I'm okay with that. I, I don't know why Vermac, I don't know why not Roberts. I don't know. I, I mean, I know why not City Hall because our roof is something and something, but I don't understand enough to say that it's a good idea or a bad idea. To me right now, every cent matters. And so I need to understand more. Um, and then on my other comment on Vermac as a whole is, is that, you know, we have this opportunity to build a park that can be transformative for an underserved community. And what that should look like may not be what's on the screen additionally. Like it may be that the play equipment needs to be larger and it needs to be some of the meadow needs to be smaller. And I wanna make sure we bake in that flexibility to, to do everything we can to make this a special place 
in my opinion, I'm one vote for the community we're trying to serve. Um, and then finally, in terms of parking, this would be a question for someone and doesn't have to be answered today. I presume if you build a park like this where you're trying to serve a ably diverse population that maybe you can't have enough handicap parking spaces for that community. So what does that mean for your parking lot? Do you stripe it differently? You know, what does that look like? And so I think we have two, for, so for me, we have two choices, to, three choices. We just defer the whole thing. We can uh, separate them out or we can vote on both together. Um, and I, th that's my perspective, but I, I am uncomfortable particularly with the Vermac plan moving forward tonight. So what works better? Um, can, I, can I just make a yes. point? So because you have more than five present, it's not technically a deferral on your bills. It's a motion to table, but yes. I just point that out. I know, and we'll learn it eventually. It's hard to unlearn 10, 11 years of <laughs> words you've been using, um, so, but table it or split it. I, what is council's perspective? And y'all can disagree with me. You can disagree with John. Go ahead, John. Again, I'm of the, the uh, opinion that we should we should table the entire matter. Um, I just think it needs to be vetted just one more time. Let it let it air itself out. Let's let it come back. And as much as this Roberts is not a neighborhood park, anything that's got a hundred and how many parking spots is not a neighborhood park. That's a citywide park. So to me, I think it needs to be vetted fully and not just with District One. So that's my opinion is to or to table both together. My opinion. Uh, go ahead, Brian. I I hate to delay this more, but I have made the comment before that sometimes you have to move at the speed of government. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I could support getting more input. I think at least listening to more voices, just if we put this off for two weeks, put it out on the website, get some feedback, get some emails, and then we'll have maybe some better information. I mean, how long are we thinking about tabling this? To me, a short table... I, to me makes sense i'm i'm fine you know especially since i you know i mentioned i've talked to groups and and the the, the connecting path was not there when i did that you know people i've talked to in my district i've said i think something's going to end up being there just because the neighborhood kids will discover that's the quick way to the park so there are to but, be clear they're already using yeah. the kids are using that the neighbors that adjoin it understand that it's the the next level is where the concerns were yeah so i the question to me then is what will that look like? Um, but but I don't have a problem with indicating that there's an existing path, but I, I'm i happy to get feedback and, and especially hear from the folks that will back up to it and get their thoughts. So. Can I, can I chime in there, Lynn? Yes. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to have a really good conversation of what that feedback looks like, of what that level of engagement would entail how long it would take because let's face it social media is an echo chamber of a small population and if somebody else has their own email list they're driving their own narrative as well so if it's going door to door and making sure everybody knows within a quarter mile i would be up for doing that and, and to, um, to be clear we met just to be clear we have met with the neighbors eric was the, i mean we have had conversation with the neighbors at the site and so this isn't an echo chain, you know, what my point is, is that they've met, they've advocated, they have seen, and now we're showing something different that they haven't seen. That's my point. So I'm, I'm, again, my question is, what does the next level of engagement right. look like? Well, I thought How level of detail is that? How long do we need? Because I'm, I'm fine for ta taking as, because, you know, if this is not going to be bonded, we don't have funds anyway right now. So if it takes another couple of months, I'd be fine with that because it's not stopping the build out because we don't have the funding for it. Well, um, it needs to so. phase in with the capital improvement committee, the sure. advisory committee. So we need two, we need two weeks and the, and we'll figure, yeah, we, it can be two weeks. I think go, go ahead. Brent hearing council, is there an opportunity to modify these mock-ups these plans put together a document by 
Thursday evening so that Friday morning there could be a push in the Friday e-news is that too quick is that something that's workable I'm trying to give them the community would have a week to get back to us yeah, and the only modifications I'm hearing are to add the additional trail of our Mac well B first use. first I mean when it comes to Roberts you were, we're thinking of B I think right. that's kind of a done decision that it's not a soccer field that it's uh right please take, please take the soccer marking so basically turn off a layer in the design so i don't i'm not hearing any major modifications to the plans so what is the what are the ticks you said the ticks what i don't know so what that the, means. the tick marks will take a little bit more time uh we have good examples of that at brook run so we can insert photos of what that looks like from our existing field uh as part of a uh, is that like every 10 and then set up for lacrosse how does it work is it lacrosse correct. football soccer everything how does it work so anywhere that you would draw a line and stop there and, and curve it or change to a different direction, there's a tick mark. So you don't have to measure anything. The the, the basic design is there. All you do is pull string and spray your fill right. paint okay. in that direction. So when you go to mark your field, you don't have to take the time of measuring out where everything goes. Uh, it's marked for uh, lacrosse full and half field at Brook Run, and then soccer is marked for half field. Um, and there's a permanent soccer overlay at Brook Run. What we would do at Roberts is just do tick marks. There wouldn't be any permanent striping for any specific sport. So we would show a full size of whatever would fit on there, and then also half fields for soccer lacrosse going to, for the two shorter fields. Um, so it would basically be a large open artificial turf field with colored tick marks for that sport. So lacrosse may be blue, soccer may be yellow. And so you would know which tick to right. spray your paint. So that would be for multi-sports and then maybe football would be red for showing every 10 yards every or something like that. So it would be for multi, you could say that in your document. Is that is that a doable plan? Can you modify and put this sort of in writing the thoughts of council by Thursday evening? So Friday morning, it could be published. I mean, I look at Pond and what they would be able to do in terms of the changes to the plans. And we can certainly put out, I don't think the modification at the Vermac side of adding that trail is it's a big deal. I think that could totally be done. Uh, we have option B pretty much done uh, for Robert. So we could just show that um, with the cost associated with that. And then I can show examples of the tick marks at Brook Run to help show that uh, option. Uh, we can also lift that soccer field overlay out of the. I'm not plan. sure you need cost. I think you need the images and the descriptions, the words. And then the examples of the tick thing, pictures with an, you know, put an asterisk C image two or something. You it does say multi-use field. Right. It does say, well, right, right. It does say People look at pictures. Field. Right. And so if it, we picture without line. Right. So yeah, that's fine. So, I, so uh, Lynn, general. if I could just kind of finish my train of thought okay. about um, getting feedback and what that looks like. Can we just kind of focus on that? Because um, now I'm just introducing that it, we have to have a deadline in two two weeks. Is that true? It would be nice. I, I will say Tom and I think are of the agreement that this, I personally think that Roberts has been vetted to the nth degree. Um, I'm fine if we need to delay two weeks to get input on, on the Vermac. And again, I don't think that we're saying that something is going there. I think we're having a tent a intent to for more connectivity. Um, I would suggest just, um, pull back the, the, the soccer markings and just leave it as a multi-use mm -hmm. with tick marks for multi-sports because we certainly haven't made a decision as to what all is going to be there either. But it is a multi-use field that can be used for a gazillion different sports. So I think just having the flexibility to be open, which is what we want. Um, and I think I think it's a great idea to put out the D News on Friday um, and then we put on it in two weeks because it has been years in the making now yeah I, i'd just like to add um i i agree with the comments made we we came out with three plans for roberts and we've added something to vermac so i in just to get it out to the public we can publish this is the final plan and i, I believe there was consensus for option b and then publish a plan of vermac with the if with trail connection if that's what the consensus is here so that the public gets the full this is what we will be voting on i would also like to recommend that for agenda purposes we put them as two separate items actually I in think, case there's an issue I that we, so we can vote separately on those but to tracy's point these these plans have been out the, uh, oh geez 
<laughs> it's just, it's, it is. It's been it very long Sorry, Stacey. It's the, it's the Stacey's point. Oh, gosh. Um, to Stacey's point, uh, th these plans have been out in the public for well over a year that we've had charrettes, we've had public meetings, we've had surveys, we've had feedback. We've we've made tweaks that what we have here tonight is based on the feedback we've gotten from the public. Um, if there was enormous outcry about anything that we were planning tonight, I think we would have heard it by now. So on Roberts, my, my recommendation is two separate agenda items next week. Um, get it, get it out to the public. And, but I would very much like us to make that decision at the next meeting. And as far as the capital projects committee goes, just for everyone's reference, uh, we are actually discussing parks projects on Wednesday. Um, so what I will do for the purposes of, we are not making final decisions as far as our evaluation, our rankings until after the 24th meeting, it would be incredibly helpful to have a final approved plan at that meeting. Um, but for in, for purposes of discussion on Wednesday, I could present what we have come with the plan B and the Vermec with the trail for discussion for that group on at, on Wednesday's meeting. One one more thought on Vermec, if I may jump in real quick. Um, when we put out the design with this potential path um, connecting down, I think we need to make a note that we haven't determined what exactly that will be like right. and how that might be buffered or screened. Right. Um, and that those will be points for further discussion. Um, you know, just thinking if we planted rows of azaleas, would that provide it? Did screen? so just to be clear, because you weren't on council, it will not matter. Okay, I I, I still think it's an important. It's fine. Point to make. You know, we don't. You can say we don't know if it's paved or natural. You need to talk to the neighbors, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, this isn't, we don't ask people to vote on things, but we can't shove, you know, put something out that's very different than what was out two weeks ago. Okay. All right. So you understand, get it in D news, please. And um, I'll ask the council people who represent those districts to reach out to the communities that are most impacted to make sure they see it. And then we'll try to, we'll bring them back as two separate agenda items in two weeks. Does that work? Go ahead, John. Madam Mayor, I'd like to table this item All right, for two we need weeks. A Motion to table. Uh, need a sec, or oh, maybe not. We, uh, okay. uh, one one point of business. Um, we do have a contract amount for sixty three hundred dollars. If I could get a motion on that tonight for approval, to, as for the additional work. I we have a motion that. pending. You can take it up. I guess I can move this. An amendment. We well, can I can. Am I'll yeah. withdraw my uh, motion if I could. Uh, Mr. Council, could I make a motion to table the matter, but yet approve the uh, amount? It's like under $7,000. 63000 for pond. No, 6300 6300 I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's better. Much better. 6300 for pond. Sorry. Right. That's my motion. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion to table for two weeks. I'll second that. Second by Rob. Um, all uh, Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand to table. Uh, that's five, I think. Oh, six. Wait, okay. Did Stacy raise her hand? Okay, it's unanimous. Um, oh, right. So we have a motion to table and to approve the contract extension for 6300 and whatever. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Michael, are you Ishri today? Yeah. Okay. The item before you is for uh, an agreement with George Power for pedestrian lighting on the Winter's Chapel path that's currently under construction. Um, before construction, there were, yeah, I think, four or five regular roadway street lights on a on the northern section of the the corridor. But this and those are being retained. But these would be pedestrian lights along the path uh, for the full length. Um, uh, 24 lights at a call co installation cost of two hundred thousand um, dollars and there's a monthly charge that would go onto our monthly electric bill um, and so we're seeking approval of this well this just discussion today but anybody have any discussion any everybody okay with consent I just would like to know what they look like. Are they the things that broke around? Are they the, the poles? Are they short? Are they five feet tall? They're, or eight they're, feet tall? Or what are they? They're the taller, the mid 
like 10 to 12 feet tall LED decorative black um, post top. Do we have any in the city mountain. right now that I can uh, look at? We do. I'm trying to think of where. Uh, well, they'll be very similar to what's on Dunway Village Parkway. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understand what we're doing and where. Can Can you put an image in the packet? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Joe, so, go ahead. I, Wait. Joe, yeah, that was question. Nice. Same question because we had the same thing happen when you did the the trail lighting in Brook Run, um, and I asked for an example of what that looked like. Secondly, is just related. This is focused for people on the trail, right? So, the height. So the the Village Parkway. That's that's a full height. Right? So it's, so this uh, is going to be. Short. I think they're ten or twelve feet tall. On on the Village Parkway. It, yes. Oh, wow. Seems taller than that. But so do we, you know, I've seen other trail lighting systems where it truly is at eye level or below for the night sky and it's purely light down. So it doesn't shine into homes, adjoining properties, and it truly is just illuminating that trail. Are, do we have that in any of our standard trail designs? I know we're bringing in the Path Foundation to help come up with standards, but um, do, is that in the spectrum of, you know, looking at types of lighting for trails to install? Uh, the standards we currently have are for uh, the roadway lighting, which are the really tall ones, and then uh, pedestrian, the decorative pedestrian lighting. Um, I'm not sure about, you know, something shorter. I mean, we don't, we, all these lights aren't required, but when you do a multi-use path, at, at intersections, there are certain light levels that have to be met, and um, I'm not sure if, if you know we could meet those with a shorter light or not. But um, but what we were proposing here is our standard pedestrian lights along roadways. All right, I'm not. I don't want to uh, okay. up, upset the the ship that sailed at the moment, so it's fine for for me for next time. But I do look forward to talking with the path. So we come up with like an inventory of different types of lights for different types of facilities and different types of locations and the night sky and, and the light um, pollution and, and, and those things as well. But, uh, yeah, I don't think these, I mean, I'll, I can talk to Georgia Power. I don't think these would be considered uh, uh, night sky light polluting. I mean, because they're on a, they're on a post top, but they have a cap on them. So the light should all be directed right. down and there'll be LED. So it is very um uh, you know more directional there's not as much light spill as there were with the traditional lights okay great thank you um okay next up is michael starling thank you uh mayor and council find my so the um i'm here to talk about a potential public art um project mm -hmm. trying to get out of that's my marker sorry about that So the um, the art commission and uh, staff has been working since 2020, February 2020. Is it not letting you share the screen? No. Can we get some IT help so that we can, because it's being broadcast. Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. Yes, look over my shoulder. I can right. get to... Okay, we go. You can also go to John's blog and <laughs> load it that way. All you have to do is come and be close <laughs> and you take care of it. Thank okay. goodness we have you as an IT. Right. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So uh, since 2020, when the Art Commission was formed and the public art uh, process, process was enacted, uh, staff has been working uh, diligently to get public art in the public. Uh, we've approved 30 different public art projects. Uh, 12 of them have been installed. We have two more that are very close to being installed. 
We've had numerous temporary projects. The Art Commission would like to do larger projects. Uh, these have been all murals, and murals are great. We love them. They're very fast and quick. But the Art Commission is looking to curate larger, more significant projects. We are working with Public Works and Parks um, on future capital projects because we think city projects are the easiest way to do that. Um, we've agreed that 1% of all future capital projects will be dedicated to public art. Um, so th that, that's going to get done. But right now, there's a project, the Womack Road project, that is coming to a close pretty soon, I think December. Um, the Art Commission would like to look at the retaining wall that is built there as a potential public art process. They have looked at a number of options and what they what they would really like to do is to uh, focus on a potential mosaic on that wall. Um, this is something like their preferred um, candidate, um, something like this or this. Um, we're here to talk to you, number one, to get it on a discussion item. What we are, time is of the essence. Um, we have not really had time to do a thorough RFP for this yet. So what we would like to do is to quickly put an RFP out on the uh, on the street to get an idea of what this is going to cost. We I think we have sixty sixty five thousand dollars in the budget that would have paid for the the for the granite facing of the wall. So we have that, but we think this could cost way more than that. So one of the things we need to think about is how bold does the commission want to be. Think about how much more money we might want to put towards this, or could we pull back a little bit and carve out a section of the retaining wall, leave that for a potential mosaic. When we get into December, the contractor could finish their project and just leave that um, portion or maybe multiple portions on the retaining wall, and then we can focus on that. One of the issues is in December, when the contractor is done, they're done and they leave. If we change our mind in the future, we would have to rebid and bring people back out. It's going to be much more expensive. So we are working right now on that RFP. We would hope to get it out very quickly, but December is fast approaching, and we're not sure we're going to get all the data before December 12th, which is your last meeting. So wanted to give you an option, opportunity to ask questions um, of me, and Michael Smith is here on, on where you want to go with this. Okay. Anybody? Catherine. I like the ribbon idea. If you're talking about cost and you just want to put a splash of color in there. I mean, you put park well on here from Barcelona. I don't want to see anything that looks like that. <laughs> yeah. That's loud. I don't want loud, I, but I love the art and I love, I love a ribbon idea. And I think that'll meet a couple of needs. If you've got a shortened time frame, if you've got a shortened, you know, the budget would be lower. It would be less loud to the to the eye I think and and maybe it's something you can without a final design have the contractor position mm -hmm. yeah I go ahead John talking to us about art right I thought that was the past. I'm not, right I'm not sure no but I'm just saying that right we're not asking for the opinion on the art all right Possible just making calls. sure of what this well uh, when it comes to the cost uh, um you have the granite facing already that's that's kind of a done deal right to a certain extent you have some segment or could be granite facing the yeah whole the whole thing is going to be granite faced and and so that budget is there about sixty five thousand. So it's just a matter of if we want no granite have it all art or have it a mix of both and how it should work yeah i again i'm okay with half granite half color mix it up how you want i'm not an artist and i'm not going to even think about it as far as the funding again i'm not sure when you said the one percent so that we, we need need to allocate money for the excess above the granite facing so, so in the future the any future capital project they'll of. have one percent of that project sort of set aside for public public art so right. The next project, like the the Georgetown Gateway or or some other project, we'll have time and we'll know what the budget is. If we wanted to be aspirational, what is one percent of this project, Michael? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, this project's only probably fifteen thousand dollars. I did one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Oh, how much well, is the right. project? It's a one point five million dollar project. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. Okay. So in future projects, that's what we would sort of carve out. No, one percent would be fifteen thousand. Right. Ten percent would be one hundred and fifty. One percent would be fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> we we weren't used to public works projects costing that little. Well, I would question yeah, really. I would qu <laughs> isn't the public works project the whole intersection? Isn't it the sewer that's connected? I mean, it's a huge project, yeah, the isn't sewer, it? Sewer, we're not paying for, are we? Is it? Yeah, the storm sewer. Yeah, uh, a, a couple of things on the. I mentioned a ribbon. That would, I think, what um, Michael was talking about is maybe blocking out some panels. Yeah. The con we could tell the contractor, you know, you leave this square out. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to do something integrated with the granite, that we wouldn't be able to get the contractor to do that. Um, and then I think the main thought is uh, for for the council to weigh in on is, you know, we've got this money in the budget that we could put towards it. But if the Arts Commission wants to do something bigger than that and it costs more than that is the city willing to put up more money for it or would you be willing to wait with an empty wall and understanding that it might take a little while to raise that money to find that money so i have thoughts which is that it sounds like that part of the reason this is a like a question is 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 that if we use paint, if it was a mural, it would be less expensive, right? I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah, right. yeah, I think right. mosaic. So the question significantly the, more expensive. So, but we're not gonna. So when the contractor leaves, we either have we need to be finished now, because once we put the what's the surface we're putting on here, granite, granite, on there, we're not gonna take granite off. No, right, and. And so it would be nice if we could figure out it's really about money. And I don't yeah, know. If money was unlimited, we could we could just say, well, right, money is not unlimited, obviously. Mosaic the entire thing. Um, and if it's so, one thing for council to consider is what Michael just said, which is, is that we can't, it's unlikely that we could just do the ribbon. Leave a blank space. Yeah, but we could leave a, a sort of almost a window. We could do or a window. Windows. Yeah, right. And, and sort of have some spaces almost to do different mosaic two or three. It's a it's a huge wall. Right. And there it's is huge. a part where that's pretty significant. Some of the other papers right. down. And they would the art commission would love to do the entire wall. I'm sure they would. I know them well. Um, that, that's what they've, they've 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 asked for. So right. alternatively, we, we could look at what, what makes sense with two or three different panels. And that would certainly limit our exposure long term and I think that would the public and the council would probably not mind that space being vacant for a little while longer instead of the entire wall being right concrete I think so I think that's fine uh, go ahead yeah no I just say I mean I think the opportunity to do this with the proximity to the Sproul Art Center it's the perfect place to do it um I love the mosaic idea but to sign off on Right, <laughs> right. Something that I have yeah, no yeah. idea the logistics, right. the cost. It, right. It's it's it can't be done at this point. So, I, but I'd love if there's time for you guys to come back and say, hey, this is what we've. Maybe we'll do a little bit more research on the on the panel idea. Right. Get the RFP and, out. Um, and and like as quickly as we can get an answer. I, I, we probably need from Michael a, a little more definitive answer on when does the contractor need to know. It's sort of the last. Minute. So we've got well, some, and then even if they leave like a panel two, three, four, five, and, and then we find out that the mosaic, even for those panels, is ridiculous, but the contractor's not done yet, they can come back in and put the granite in there. If we probably, I mean, we can paint it, well, or we can paint it. So yeah. one of my questions is, is if we, if you go back, I mean, it's great. This looks great, and I would love to do it. Maybe even the gaudy one, but probably not the gaudy one. And we're not, we're not, we have an art commission to John's point, so we don't have to like analyze this stuff. But the question for the art commission is, is would they rather have a mural that's the whole thing or a panel or two of a mosaic, I think. And I don't want to make that decision. I want them to make a recommendation. And so. That, that's, that's also a really big mural. Well, right. So maybe it's a smaller mural, but there would still be more art on the, I would guess that it would be more art on the wall. 
it's 65,000 with a mural than a mosaic, which is not to say we shouldn't do a mosaic and it's, it's all going to be good. I, I, we, we certainly could talk to them about that and get right. their opinions. Right. I think from our discussions with them, they, they think the murals have, are, are, are doing themselves and that's, that's great. I think the the mosaic idea is really sort of the way they want to go. Love the mosaic idea. Mm -hmm. Just we don't know whether we can afford it or not. So I All think right. our ask to you is to I got try a couple to questions. The sixty five thousand dollar budget, and if it's impossible to even get one panel of mosaic, ask the art commission to make some tough choices or come back to us. And Joe has a question, and I forgot again. Sorry, Joe. Thanks. Um, so well, let me talk to Michael. Michael, mm -hmm. you answer me. All right. right. Thank you much. So what if we don't put granite on it? Or maybe this is a Michael Smith. I'll talk to the, one of the Michaels, right? What if we say um, we want to get the RFP out and you want to find out what are the cost options, right? So yeah, get let us understand what the world is, what the spectrum is of full or partial, leaving some spaces for possible mosaics or spaces for future painting, whatever. I'd like to get that information, part A. Then part B is, what if we don't put the granite on it? Does what, what does it look like? Is it just like cement? Is it structurally sound before we put granite on it? Can we wait to do the granite is my question. Yes, if, if we didn't put the granite on it, it would just be plain concrete. And you can come back and put the granite on anytime, really. Um, if you do it, if we ask the contractor to leave out some places and then we turn around later and say, come back and fill those in, they will probably want to charge us a little more for that. If we wait till they're done and then we have to put the granite on later after the contractors left, you know, we'll have to get somebody else to do it and it might cost more. But so it's a matter of cost. The, the granite could be put on at any time, but it's just a matter of cost. So we're already contracted to them to do granite there. Right. And as long as we have them do it before their project is done, we will pay the price that's already in the contract. If we, if we ask them to come back multiple times or we have to get somebody to come in after the fact, it'll be a different price. So you the, find some utility the, relocation to stall them? Well, the, the, the one, the, the, they won't be done by December. I need to make sure everybody understands that. that. But we were talking, when we talked about it, we said we really probably need a, kind of a path forward by December because by the time you get an artist hired and all that, that, you know, to get them in there before the contract is done. All right. So thanks. I just wanted to know that it's structurally sound with it's just poured concrete. Yes. And then we can, if we decide to go forward, okay, fine. Um, so, okay. So Michael Starling, you're looking at getting us some more information, hopefully by our single meeting in December. Is that what you're backing into? Yeah, I think that's the the, the latest. And, and that sounds like maybe we, we can make that and, and maybe price it out two different ways on panels. And then the en entire thing is, is we're doing research right now, but it's, it's there you go. a little difficult finding what a, and and I three hundred thousand dollars it could be. And don't don't we have some excess get leftover funds in the twenty two budget for public art as well? Do we have some funding? Um, twenty five. No, we will not. Twenty five thousand this year is going towards the Marta mural that was just approved, and then next year there's another twenty five. So every year we do have fifty thousand. So we will have some more money next year in our public art budget to go along with the sixty five. So there's a a way to increase that number. We just don't know if that's even going to be close to what it is. And so the, the materials are, I took, yeah, it's expensive. Like it's sprawl, just the material fee for the little stuff. So yeah. this will be interesting to price out. Yeah. So thank you. All okay, right. Well, well, we look forward to more information. All right. Thank you. It is a, I would love to have it, make no mistake. Mm -hmm. It's or some version of it. It would be really, really nice. Um, okay. So we've already done number 13. Everybody was okay with that. That was the ARP. We did it during the budget. We talked about it during the budget. Um, all right, so public comments. I think we have, come on up. Did you, do you have a card? Okay, great. If you'll hand it to somebody, Jay will take it. Come on up and introduce yourself, please. And you'll have three minutes. Make sure the microphone's on, which it probably is. 
a short cruise list. Yeah. Right. Good. Good. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay. So my name is Marcellus, and I came because the um, I've been communicating with the mayor and the public works director about the Ashford Center Parkway, uh, the street lights, and I was told that um, when you guys do projects, it's based off the crash history, which I think is quite ridiculous. Uh, if safety is priority, then I notice you guys are talking about parks and all that type of things. Um, but street lights and stuff like that should be a priority over some parks. So uh, another thing I wanted to say on a, on a good note is I appreciate the mayor because she's always uh, communicating with me. Anytime I have any questions, she's always uh, very fast to respond. And uh, I'm always talking to state legislators. And to be honest, they're just not as good as her. Uh, so I want to say thank you. But I do think that um, you all should reconsider as far as waiting to crashes to happen uh, because on Ashford Center Parkway, that can also cause crime as well uh, when you don't have street lights or whatever people. Crime is normally deterred when you have street lights uh, um, on the streets or whatever. So that's all I want to say. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. Thanks for staying. <laughs> We did an executive session for litigation, personnel, and real estate. Y'all didn't know that, huh? Okay. Um, council comments? Anybody? I go ahead. I'll just ask uh, that the Joe also is raising his hand, by the way. Okay, um, thank you. That the Citizen Capital Camp uh, Committee be added the project of Peachtree Middle School, the documentation, just for consideration for their uh, their committee, just to discuss it and see where it's at. Thank you, Tom. Joe. Sure. Um, just got some general comments. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, general comment. Uh, go Braves in the playoffs. Um, the Community Action Center has a vintage affair, their annual fundraiser, Oktoberfest at the Mercedes Benz headquarters on October 22nd. Um, early voting starts uh, October 17th, and it goes through November 4th at the Dunwoody Library. Um, you can go online and get the hours. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I hope that my peers will block off Jan, uh, June, <laughs> December 6th for their Safe Streets workshop that uh, it's going to be very well um, uh, level set all of us peers up, he, up here on the dais of understanding some terminology and best practices and some things we can do quicker, sooner rather than later. And, and the final thing I wanna talk about is um, anti-Semitism and what's happening in the public lately. And, you know, in the army or whether you're in church or community, you know, you're, you're neighbors to somebody, you're nice to somebody in front of them. And then all of a sudden people get on social media or you're in your circle and, and things happen. And you know, in the army, it was you know on the spot cor correction, bad behavior. You never let something go unchallenged that is false or it's bad behavior. And and obviously, anti-Semitism has no place in in our community, in our city, in our state, or in our nation. And um, I, I stand uh, behind that statement and uh, uh, d do not condone any persons to make any of those statements um dismaying that or 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 you know making that that uh, issues of our friends as well so those are my comments thank you thank you joe i just have two eric they're really both for you and i think brent left but the concert was our biggest concert ever i think saturday night um oh he's still there i can't, there's a post i'm sorry there's a post and i'm short okay well it was our biggest I think event ever at the amphitheater and it was very successful despite the band's reluctance to start on time um the best way I can say it but um it was everything ran really smoothly a big kudos to your team um looking forward to concerts next year as well and then yes you have your I see that your koozie and then when we come back to talk about 
Vermac and Roberts again, if we could get maybe a little more detail on the solar. I'm really skeptical. I know that lots of people up here are very pro-solar. I'm not anti-solar. I'm just concerned about that expenditure there. So if we could just get more information or something. So anyway, with that, I need a motion for executive, was it, was for everything, right? Personnel. Move to exit to executive session for purposes of personnel, personnel litigation in real estate. Uh, second. Second, moved by Stacy. second by Rob. All in favor say aye, you don't really have a choice. Aye. We'll be back. What'd you say? What was the quiz question? Um, Do I have a separate link? I did not have this one going four hours. I believe it's going to be the same link as the one that you used at the five o'clock meeting. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ginger. Uh huh. I don't know what I was thinking because the budget hearing always takes a long time. I'll be up in a second and make a quick bio break.
We are still live recording, by the way. Just let me know. Oh, this is still on. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second.